The plot takes place somewhere in the village. We observe its inhabitants. The villagers turn their gaze to the sky. A crowd of dragons hovered in the sky. The war began. The dragons started destroying houses and killing people. The war lasted a long 13 years. In the face of powerful dragons, humans were powerless. Humanity began to die out. One of the dragons let out a powerful roar. However, the man didn't give up and continued to fight them. The man talked about how he killed the dragons one by one. This man was the eldest son of the Duke of the Arden family, who was famous for his swordsmanship skills. The eldest son was the most talented swordsman in the Western continent. He was a dragon slayer. The eldest son was the last hero of the Kingdom of Hydern. The man was at a loss. The dragon grabbed him. He was extremely dissatisfied with what was happening. We were shown Drachesis, the Dragon King. The man thought that the dragon was very strong. The dragon attacked him. He was badly injured. Blood came out of the man's mouth. The man thought of his father, who had counted heavily on him. Father, the breathless man said. I remember your last words. I'm sorry I didn't keep my promise, the man thought. He thought back to how, at his sister's funeral, he had vowed to rid the continent of dragons. I'm not the most talented swordsman, and I'm not much of a dragon slayer, he thought. The man was very sorry that Terran's sacrifice was in vain. Someone was calling out to him. Ethan, the stranger was saying. He was thinking that someone was calling him. The stranger was asking him to wake up. The man thought that it was a very familiar voice. Ethan, the woman shouted. Ethan finally opened his eyes. Ethan realized that his sister was right next to him. He was glad to have his sister by his side. Yes, I thought you'd never wake up, my sister said, fighting back tears. Ethan didn't understand how she was his sister here. She was killed in a dragon attack, Ethan mused. We're being shown the funeral of Ethan's sister. He thought that he was also dead and could not protect anyone. Ethan Arden, what a disgrace you are, he thought to himself. Ethan turned his gaze back to his sister. He didn't understand why his sister was dressed like this. Of course I told her to be more modest, Ethan thought. He knew it didn't matter at the moment. Ethan had said he was glad to see her. How do you like the afterlife? Ethan asked. His sister was taken aback. She asked him not to take any more risks like this. The nurse told Ethan that her death wasn't his fault. Please don't put yourself in such danger again, she continued. He didn't know what his sister was talking about. Ethan's sister looked thoughtful. An idea popped into her head. She asked him to wait a bit. I'll make some soup, the nurse said. Can you cook it yourself? Ethan asked. His sister asked him to lie down and not get up anywhere. Ethan said he would do as she asked. She never knew how to cook, Ethan thought, shocked. Ethan thought that in the afterlife, not only had his sister's position changed, but her character had also changed. He realized that he needed to get up. Ethan was surprised. He was watching the source of life. A magical device to keep you alive in a coma, Ethan reasoned. He didn't understand why he was connected to it. Did I pass out in the afterlife? Ethan thought to himself. He couldn't understand why he was so weak. Ethan couldn't feel his mana at all. Ethan wondered if he might have had a mana burst. Can this really happen in the afterlife? Ethan would say, surprised. He realized that he couldn't even walk in this state. Ethan touched the source of life. He reasoned about how he needed to absorb mana from the source of life. The mana absorption process began. At least this way I can get up, Ethan thought to himself. Ethan got up from the bed. He began to stretch his arms. Looks like first aid has more or less worked, Ethan thought. Ethan's sister said his soup was ready. She was shocked when he got out of bed. Did you turn off the life source? What is it? The worried nurse asked. She asked him if he understood his condition. Ethan's sister didn't understand how he could move at all. Ethan said he was fine. Everything is working out fine he continued. She didn't understand how this was possible. The doctor said that after you wake up, you will need at least six months of treatment before you can walk, said Ethan's sister. Ethan asked him how long he'd been unconscious. His sister replied, 10 years. Ethan was shocked. He didn't understand how he could have been in a coma for 10 years. She asked him to sit down. You just woke up, don't strain yourself, she said. Ethan agreed with her. She asked if he needed to be fed. No, thanks, Ethan said. He asked me to tell my sister how life works in the afterlife. His sister was upset. Ethan's sister didn't understand why he was talking about an afterlife. She was startled by his behavior. You're awake, she said. Ethan's sister said that everything would be fine now. Ethan was a little taken aback. You're dead, he said. Ethan went on to say that he, too, had died, the third son and youngest. Everyone is alive, his sister shouted. She asked Ethan to listen to her. His sister said they weren't in the afterlife. Both the third son and the youngest are still alive, just like you and me, she continued. Ethan didn't know what was going on, so I'm not dead. That's right, he mused. I remember exactly how the Dragon King killed me, Ethan thought. 
But suddenly, a thought occurred to him. I'm really not dead and this is real. He thought to himself. Ethan asked his sister how old she was now. She told him that she was now 20 years old. He also asked about his age. The nurse said he was 19 years old. Ethan was shocked. He reasoned that when he was 19 years old, his kingdom was attacked by dragons. So the First Continental War is in full swing. Ethan thought to himself. He asked his sister what news she knew about the war. Ethan was asking about his father. Has he already gone to the front? He continued. Ethan's sister didn't know what he was talking about. The war ended 15 years ago, she told him. The sister added that it was at that moment that their father died. Our family sacrificed a lot, all in order to conclude a peace treaty with these monsters, she said. Ethan was surprised that his family had made a peace treaty with the dragons. Yes, exactly, the nurse added. Ethan remembered that they hadn't made any peace treaty. It was like everything was going wrong, he thought. Ethan assumed he'd gone back in time. The past was different, he thought to himself. If this really isn't the afterlife and I'm not dead, Ethan kept thinking. He was talking about going back 13 years. So I ended up in a parallel world. Ethan thought to himself. He asked what had happened to his subordinates. My sister said they weren't there. Ethan was surprised they weren't there. He asked her why it had happened. Ethan's sister said they didn't have any more money. Ethan asked how things were going with the family treasures. If we sell them, he continued. Ethan, our home is here now, she said. His sister had told Ethan that they didn't have anything of value left. Ethan knew that the past was very different from what he remembered. Tell me you're joking, he said. His sister said that wasn't the case. Our family has fallen, she continued. Ethan was shocked. I'm back with my broken family, he thought to himself. Ethan was afraid it was all true. My family is completely ruined, he realized. The plot introduces us to one of the seven countries of the western continent, the kingdom of Hyder. We are told that this country was very small. But the family of the Duke of Art, were swordsmen who have no equal on the entire continent came from here. Thanks to their merits, they always lived in luxury, even when humanity was on the verge of extermination. And we've been living like this for 10 years. Ethan asked, puzzled. His sister didn't know what to say to her. Ethan remembered a completely different past. I thought I'd died fighting the Dragon King. But somehow I ended up at the time when I was 19. He mused. Ethan was angry that his family was broke. He didn't understand what was going on. You said our family sacrificed a lot during the war, Ethan said. He asked if there was any reward for this. His sister said they got a reward. Ethan asked what the reward was. Immunity, she replied. He didn't understand what they were talking about. His Majesty, the 17th King Sigmund declared us the defenders of the kingdom and ordered us to be treated accordingly, said Ethan's sister. Ethan was surprised that even the king was different. He asked her to continue her story. My sister said that Ethan was awarded first, and the king granted him immunity, which exempted him from any crimes other than high treason. My sister added that this immunity will last for three generations. So I'll get away with anything other than high treason, Ethan thought to himself. He thought that even murder would be forgiven. Ethan knew that this was a huge amount of power. He asked if that was all. The sister said that they were also given gold and jewelry, but the family kept them at home. Family, Ethan asked, puzzled. Didn't you say that our home is here now? He continued. Ethan's sister went on to say that they had been moved to this hunting lodge 10 years ago. She said that it was the decision of the Senate, which temporarily became the head of the Arden family. And who had the nerve to do that? Ethan asked. His sister had told Ethan that there were 10 indirect descendants of their family in the Senate. After the battle with the dragons, in which my father and grandfather died, the king ordered the Senate to temporarily take care of the family, she said. She added that the king was afraid of Ethan's abuse of immunity. Our king was even more... But this Sigmund is even worse, Ethan thought angrily. He didn't think the Senate was going to take over and put us in the pot, Ethan thought. He asked his sister about the position of head of the family. My sister said the Senate would vote when Ethan turned 20. So, it hasn't been decided yet that I will become one. What is it? He asked. She told him that this was the original plan. But while Ethan was in a coma, the Senate rejected it. Of course, if I become the head of the family, they'll have a hard time, Ethan thought to himself. He thought that in this scenario he would be able to slaughter everyone who had caused his family to suffer with impunity. Ethan knew that his 20th birthday was still eight months away. Tears welled up on Ethan's sister's face. She asked for his forgiveness. It's all my fault, my sister would say. If I had tried harder, you wouldn't have fallen into a coma due to the mana release, she continued. Ethan was thinking about his past. When I was nine, I struggled to regain the skill of conducting that our family had lost, he said. However, when I tried to restore it, I had a mana burst, Ethan continued to think. He understood that his siblings had no real power to thwart the tyranny of the Senate. 
Ethan asked his sister to stop crying. He said it wasn't her fault. Her sister felt that she had to do something to protect their family. Ethan said it was all his own fault because he'd put so much responsibility on his sister. The nurse asked Ethan to look at her. All that matters now is that you are alive and well, said the happy sister. He was reassured by his sister's words. He told his sister that she was a wonderful cook. She was glad he liked it. The nurse told Ethan to rest. You've only just come to your senses, she continued. Ethan said goodnight to his sister. See you tomorrow. Ethan, his sister replied. What a mess this place is, he thought to himself. Get out. Stop it, the man shouted. Ethan ordered the man to stay away from him. The man was taken aback. The subordinates were terrified. Ethan lifted the man up. I'm almost a nobleman, said he, taken aback. So what if it's an archduke, the man continued. Ethan asked him what he meant. The man was afraid of Ethan's gaze. He talked about how his status didn't give Ethan the right to talk to him like that. Do you think Baron Karga's family will let you get away with this? He continued. Ethan asked the man what family he was talking about. Ethan slapped the man across the face. Ethan had told him that it didn't hurt to dream. Do you think the pathetic Baron and his family can protect you? He asked the man if he respected his family. The man didn't understand why Ethan had hit him. Ethan asked him if he really didn't understand why he'd hit him. The man was confused. It's because of the Archduchess, he thought to himself. His subordinates were asking for someone to help Ethan. The man told them to move. Ethan released the man. Listen, Ethan would say. The man was waiting for his words. He asked him to be more helpful. The man was taken aback. I will, your grace. Stop it, the man shouted. Crazy man, he's completely out of his mind. He thought to himself. Ethan started to walk away. He didn't understand why Ethan had so much power. The man assumed that he was using mana. We need to report everything to the Baron immediately. The man continued to think. You pathetic worm, you're going to pay for this. He thought. Ethan thought that he was very weak. If I didn't use my prepared mana, I would have made a f myself, he mused. Ethan was angry that his family had dared to cross the road. The Senate, then I'll kill them all, Ethan thought to himself. He thought that he would prove to them his primacy for the throne. But first, he wanted to check the condition of his body. Ethan began to meditate. I knew it, he thought. Because of the mana release, it broke into fragments, Ethan mused. Hands and feet, hands and ankles, they're all over the place. But the truth is, it's not so bad, Ethan thought to himself. In a way, he thought it was a good thing. Ethan knew that if he had been a simple knight, he would have died long ago. But I'm still the best swordsman on the continent, Ethan thought. He was aware that his body was in good condition considering that he had been in a coma for 10 years. It's true that the veins that carry mana have weakened, Ethan thought. He knew that everything needed to be fixed gradually. Ethan decided to start with resonance. Further, the plot tells us what resonance is. When resonating, you absorb the appropriate wavelength of mana from the environment and concentrate it at a single point until you restore the desired amount. Ethan decided to start with the brush that holds the sword. He started the process. Ethan thought about how he'd spent the entire morning focusing on resonance. The main character thought about starting the training session. He thought to himself, before you start honing the technique, you should at least restore your stamina. Ethan started his training session. His training session lasted an entire day. The subordinates were shocked by Ethan's stamina. So much training in this state, the man thought. Ethan turned his attention to the guy running behind him. He asked what he wanted. Mr. Myers is making a scene in the bar again and her ladyship won't stop him, the guy said. He decided to find out who Ethan was, since this was the first time he'd seen him. Ethan was surprised by Myers' behavior. The main character is immersed in the memories that connected him with Myers. Would you like a drink? He said. Myers said that alcohol is bad for the muscles. His father said it was a holiday. Food, sleep, and exercise, he thought to himself. Myers said he'd rather have some milk. He ate only protein foods and drank only milk, Ethan reasoned. He remembered that Myers had been the biggest of them all since he was a kid. And he, obsessed with training and a clear schedule, made a scene in the bar. Ethan kept thinking, surprised. The main character called Hans. Let's find Myers. Ethan continued. Hans followed him. The boys went looking for Myers in a bar. Hans had mentioned that Myers had recently been seen in this bar with some people. He assumed Myers was here today, too. It probably wasn't the first time this had happened to Myers, Ethan reasoned. He told Hans to go to the bar. A brawler and a friend of hooligans, is this really my hardworking brother? Ethan kept thinking. He didn't understand what had happened to his brother. Ethan and Hans were watching a drunken Myers. Myers demanded a drink, smashing everything in his path. Ethan turned his attention to him. He didn't understand what had happened to Myers. The guy asked the Duke to stop. Today, the energy is rushing out of him, the stranger added. 
Ethan was very annoyed. Ethan broke the table in two with just one punch. The people around them were shocked. We are transported back to Meyer's memories. Ethan's brother bravely fights dragons. Myers shouted to his brother that he would deal with them. He asked me to run away. Drunk, Myers was talking about Ethan nearly breaking his bottle. He didn't understand why he was seeing his brother. Am I dreaming? Myers continued. Ethan was baffled. He was always quiet, but fierce, Ethan thought. I can drink more than anyone else on the continent, Myers said. Ethan was very angry. Ethan knocked Myers out with one punch. Myers, we'll deal with your problem later. No, he said. Myers fell asleep. Hands pointed to the b Myers was dealing with. The stranger was surprised to see Ethan. Didn't he die ten years ago from a burst of mana? He thought. The man asked what they would do. The stranger said that Ethan is immune, so they need to leave. There's no need to make things worse, he thought to himself. Oh, your grace, we were so worried about the young master, the stranger was saying. He added that Myers had been drinking too much. But now, I'm calm. The stranger continued. He said they should go. Leaving already. Ethan asked, furious. The stranger didn't understand what was happening. It's bad, what do we do now? He thought to himself. He asked me to tell Myers that they had a great time. Ethan asked them who exactly had given them permission to leave. He started toward them. The man said that it was better not to do this. It seems that you are still too weak, he continued. The man told Ethan to leave them alone as long as he was okay. Ethan slammed him into the wall with one punch. There was a loud crash. The stranger was taken aback. Looks like the Duke's family really isn't counted on much anymore, Ethan thought to himself. How dare you pathetic bugs laugh at the Duke's people? Ethan kept thinking angrily. He said they had made a terrible mistake. The stranger asked him not to do anything with it, but it was too late. He could sense the mana that was coming from Ethan's body. I thought he couldn't use it anymore. The stranger thought. He thought that with Ethan's amount of mana, he could handle him. Ethan twisted the stranger's arms with a single movement. He screamed in pain. Angry customers rushed to the rescue. How dare you get involved with the Ardents? Ethan thought. He was thinking of revenge for his younger brother. Shouts could be heard all over the bar. Hans was in shock. Ethan ended the fight. Monster. Hans thought, looking at him. Ethan called Hans. He ordered Hans to clean up while he and his brother went home. The plot tells us that after the death of the father, the death of the mother followed. Myers was too young to remember much of his parents. Someone was trying to calm the crying Myers. He told us about Ethan's replacement father. Brother, Myers shouted. I guess I got so drunk last night that even my brother was freaking out, Myers mused. He was very sorry that he was gone. Awake, Ethan asked. Myers was very scared. Little brother, is that really you? He said. Yes, I'm back with you, Ethan replied. Myers ran to him. Little brother, Myers shouted happily. Looks like just a temporary blur, Ethan thought to himself. He realized that Myers hadn't changed at all. Hey, I can't breathe, Ethan replied happily. Myers apologized to him. He said he wouldn't touch any more alcohol. Why so strict? Ethan asked. He offered him a drink to the reunion. Ethan asked where Taryn was. Ethan said his sister hadn't told him anything about him. Well, anyway, he went to another family to learn their technique, Myers said. He said, since grandpa and dad are dead and you're in a coma, we don't have foresight anymore, Myers added. Ethan didn't know what she was talking about. He asked Myers what it meant to leave for another family. I'm sorry, I don't know the details myself, Myers would say. Ethan asked him if he had any information on where Taryn was going. Hans asked permission to enter. On time, as always, Ethan thought to himself. He told him to come in. Oh, Mr. Myers, are you awake yet? Hans asked. Ethan asked Hans what he wanted. Hans handed Ethan a bag of money. Hans said he got them while he was cleaning up. We were very short of money, Ethan thought. Ethan said he wouldn't have thought of that on his own. He praised Hans. The rest is for you, Ethan added. Hans was very happy about it. Thank you, your grace, Hans shouted. He said he was happy to serve him. It's quick to learn, and it's useful, Ethan reasoned. He was concerned that Taryn was in trouble. I wish I knew where he'd gone, but at least he was alive, Ethan kept thinking. He knew he had to rebuild his family. Ethan called out to his brother. He asked me to show him my wrist. Why? Myers asked. I'll make sure you don't kill yourself with the booze, Ethan said. He started checking the body. The energy is polluted, but the mana is normal. Providence is not at all proficient. Ethan reasoned. If he had mastered the family breathing technique, his mana would burn like a flame, Ethan continued to think. He was glad that Myers was still talented. Ethan said it wasn't so bad. He told Myers that if he started training, he could become a knight. But your condition is far from ideal, so you'll have to choose between attacking and defending. Ethan continued. A knight, aren't you kidding? Myers asked, surprised. 
Ethan said he knew their family's secrets. He said that he would help his brother become a knight if he wanted to. Myers thought it was impossible. So you have to choose between attacking and defending. Myers asked, motivated. He said he would choose protection. I will protect you and our family, added Myers. Ethan noted that in this case, he will face grueling training sessions. He asked if his brother was ready for this. You bet, Myers replied. Ethan asked Hans to bring sandbags and wooden swords. He understood that all the secrets of his family were kept inside him. Sure, it's too late to start training at 15, but he definitely has the potential, Ethan reasoned. He hoped to make a decent man out of Myers. The action takes place in the house of Baron Cargas. He was the head of the Baron Helmuth family. Helmut wondered if Ethan had finally woken up. Hans asked if he had been summoned. Send a letter to Count Ferner, Helmut said. Hans accepted his request. Archduke Ethan, talented and fit, looked just like his father, Helmut reflected. He knew he had to break the news to the Senate. Ethan had told Myers that when he swung his sword, you had to shape it so that the attack would not be a single movement but a sequence of movement. Ethan launched a series of attacks on Myers. He was defeated. So when you block an attack, don't focus on one hit, Ethan added. He was telling him to deflect blow after blow. If you understand everything, get up. No, Ethan said. He noted that the enemy will not wait while he is lying around. Or is your will so weak? Ethan asked. Of course not, Myers said. He stood up again, picking up his sword. Myers talked about not giving up yet. I'll block your punch no matter what it takes, he added. Ethan was glad of Meyer's attitude. They resumed their training. Training from the very morning without a break, Monsters turned his brother, whom he hadn't seen in ten years, into a bloody mess, the subordinate mused. He didn't understand how Myers could enjoy this process. Oh, if he's beating up his own brother like that, you need to be very quiet and not get on his nerves, especially I need to treat the Archduchess well. The subordinate continued to think. Ethan's sister didn't understand how they needed to live now. So much had changed since Ethan had woken up, she kept thinking. Ethan's sister noted that it was from that day that everyone started working hard. The chief chamberlain. No, she said. A frightened subordinate waited for the order. What did Ethan tell you? That everyone went to work after that. The archduchess asked. The subordinate thought of Ethan punching him in the face. Monstrous memories, the chamberlain thought to himself. Ethan's sister was puzzled. The chamberlain apologized for waiting. If the archduke talks like that, then I don't want to talk to him anymore. The Chamberlain thought. He suggested that she try some freshly baked cookies. And the weather is wonderful. Can you arrange a tea party? What is it? He asked. The Archduchess thanked him. She didn't understand why he'd changed the subject. Doesn't want to answer. Ethan's sister thought to herself. She really liked the cookies. Hans was standing next to the magic ball. Careful, this stone is worth what I earn in a month, Hans thought. He carefully held the stone up to the magic ball. Hans, I was just waiting for your report, Helmut said. Hans asked him how he was feeling. Did you hear the Archduke woke up? Helmuth continued. Hans revealed that this is true, and he also added that Ethan can already use mana. Hem, so he's still as talented as he was ten years ago, Helmut replied. He added that a meeting of the elders was expected soon. Helmut asked me to keep him posted. Hans obeyed the order. He was talking about Ethan being very violent, so they needed to be careful. Helmut said it didn't matter. At the meeting, everything will go the way we want, added Helmut. He asked Hans to keep an eye on him. He thanked Helmut. I'll expect your report in a month, Helmut added. Hans went to the window. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Hans mused. He knew that Helmut hadn't seen Ethan's true strength. I'll watch for now, and then I'll join the winner. Hans kept thinking. He knew perfectly well that if he was near the winner, he would be able to grab a big piece of the pie. The Archduchess informed Hans that Ethan and Myers had finished their training. Bring cold water and wet towels. My sister continued. She also added that Hans should set the tea to be prepared. In the meantime, we must try not to get on the Archduke's nerves, Hans reasoned. The Dukes continued their training. Myers dodged Ethan's attack. Just look at him, the Duke thought. We've only been training for a couple of weeks, and he's already getting used to my punches, Ethan thought. He prepared to attack Myers again. He dodged his older brother's attack. Ethan was surprised by this. I blocked it. Myers shouted happily. He thought he was already a professional. Ethan would say, you're as good as the moon at being a professional. He told him that when you think about a blocked shot, you start to lose your guard. Ethan added that he should never lower his sword. Myers had a lump on his head. Even though I said that, I have to admit, he has innate strength and stamina, and he can adapt quickly. Ethan reasoned. He thought that soon Myers would be able to fight on equal terms with a real knight. Hans praised Ethan. He said there was food waiting for them on the table. Hans asked how their training session went. You look better and better every day. 
added Nas. Ethan didn't understand why he was up to him. Han said he had something to tell Ethan. To tell you the truth, Baron Kargas contacted me today, Han said. Ethan was surprised by this. Yes, he ordered me to keep an eye on you and report everything to him, continued the subordinate. Ethan asked what the problem was. Hans was angry because Kargas thought he was unfaithful to Ethan. I'm your loyal subordinate. Hans continued. I was ready to curse him. Stop it. He shouted. Hans said he had asked him for more money. And I need the money, Ethan thought to himself. Hans said that if they needed anything, they could use the Baron's money. Ethan asked him to bring a pen and paper. Pathetic worm, trying to wait it out and then join one of us, Ethan thought. He didn't see it as a problem because he was only too happy to use hands. Such simpletons are the easiest to deal with. The Duke continued to think. Hands asked me to buy things in the city that are written on paper. Hands started reading the list. Sword, shield, training gear, yeah, got it, he said. Ethan said that all the money that the Baron sends, Hands can take for himself. Your humble subordinate will run all the errands right now. Hands shouted. Ethan asked Myers what he knew about Providence. Myers said he didn't know anything. I think my sister and brother will, too. He added. Myers was surprised that Ethan knew about him. Myers asked Ethan did your father teach you that? He said it was true. Ethan said that all of Hans's purchases would come in handy for the fight. Myers asked what it was all about. Look, Myers, you're going to bring glory back to our family, Ethan would say. So, he decided to turn his younger brother into a real knight. Our providence is fundamentally different from that of other family, Ethan said. He added that Myers needed a lot of determination. Myers, are you ready to throw away all the mana you've accumulated in your entire life? Ethan asked. Myers said he was fully prepared for it. For the sake of the family and you, brother. Myers added. The subordinate ran to Vilden's door. Sir Vilden, trouble. Stop it. He shouted. Young master barged in here and started a fight. The subordinate continued. Vilden asked if he had misheard. He talked about how Myers had been drinking a lot until yesterday, and Wilden was surprised that he had decided to start a riot at the Red Scorpion's headquarters today. The plot moves back two days. Ethan asked Myers to sit in the lotus position. He said he would teach him a new breathing technique. You know that the Arden family's providence is based on Black Flame, right? Ethan asked. He said that the Black Flame Foundation, Black Flame Breath. Black Flame is the symbol of the Arden family. If I pass through all four stages, resonance, dispel, circulation, and enlightenment, will my mana really turn into Black Flame? Myers reasoned. Ethan said that Myers is a true descendant of the Arden family, so he must master the Black Flame. He was talking about how he needed to completely get rid of his mana first. That's it, empty the mana center, now fill it with flames, Ethan was saying. Get rid of the impure mana and replace it with fire, Ethan used to say. He told him to slowly activate the mana center after that. You're surrounded by burning flames right now, Ethan added. There is a mountain view in front of us. Color filtered through the window. Myers opened his eyes. It was the first time he had seen his family's mana. Little brother, I can sense perfect mana. That's right, Myers said. It won't be easy at first, but if you train hard, you'll feel like everything will change when your mana finally becomes a flame, Ethan said. He added that it will take about two months to complete the resonance. Ethan said he had to go somewhere to do it. Myers was a little taken aback. Hans stated that they had arrived at the designated location. Red Scorpion headquarters, they were the ones who master, Hans said. He said that according to the rumors, the Elder has mana. Ethan told Myers to ask them a question. Myers kicked the door open. Well, you miserable worms, are you ready to die? Myers shouted. People didn't understand what was going on. You will pay for daring to offend the Duke's family. Myers shouted. Wait, we were drinking together just the other day, said the surprised people. What kind of joke is this? What is it? He asked the men. It looks like I'm joking. No, said an enraged Myers. He slapped the man across the face. A fight broke out in the bar. Take it. Stop it, the man shouted. Hans was terrified of what was happening. Myers had gotten a lot stronger in the last few days, Ethan mused. He assumed that Myers still lacked confidence because he was ashamed of everything he had done. Stop it, the man shouted. So I brought him here, even if it wasn't safe, Ethan thought to himself. He believed that by doing so, Myers would atone for his sins. Die, you wretched worm. The guy shouted. Myers dodged his attack. Ethan was happy with Myers' result. Exposing the part of your body that will suffer the least, that's not bad, Ethan mused. Myers attacked the guy. If he tried to dodge, he would lose the advantage and open up to attacks, Ethan continued to think. He asked Hans what Hans thought about the Myers fight. Hans thought he was very creepy. His brother had just been stabbed with a sword, Hans thought. He said he expected nothing less from Myers. 
And it was only a couple of days ago that he picked up the shield for the first time. Ethan's subordinate continued. Vilden told them to stop. What is all this supposed to mean? Wilden asked Myers. Do you think you can get away with it? Wilden asked. Ethan stiffened. Brother Archduke is a monster, Vilden thought to himself. He asked Ethan why he had broken his brother's arms. Anything else you want to say? The Duke asked. What an upstart, I would have arrived. But we must hold on, Vilden thought. He thought that he should discuss everything with the Baron first. Vilden offered to complete the fraternal showdown. Let's be honest, we have suffered a lot of damage. But given your family's reputation, we will go our separate ways in peace, Vilden continued. Ethan was furious. He almost killed my brother, and now he's playing nice, Ethan thought. He told Myers they were all true. Ethan told him not to feel sorry for them. It looks like if we want to teach them a lesson, we'll have to cripple everyone, the Duke said. Vilden said that if Ethan didn't stop, he would have to step in. Ethan was telling him to take action. Vilden was struck by the presence of fire mana. I've heard that the Arden family's mana burns like a flame, Vilden thought. He couldn't believe it was all true. Fire mana, Archduke, I don't care, he thought to himself. Do you think the mighty Vilden will be afraid of you? He continued to think. Vilden said that now Ethan will regret what he said. He expertly dodged Vilden's direct strike. Pathetic worm, Ethan said. He threw a series of punches at Wilden. He could barely stand on his feet. Ethan's aura scared him. Ethan asked who had taught him the breathing technique. It looks like you're also stealing combat techniques. He continued. Vilden was confused. Ethan said if he didn't tell him, he'd make him. Wait, Vilden shouted. I was taught this by Baron Cargas, said Vilden. Ethan was extremely surprised by this. Do you want me to ruin the life of the youngest of the ducal family, said Vilden. Cargas said that the purpose of this assignment was to render Myers useless so that he could not fulfill his role. Vilden noted that if he wants to do this without a trace, it will take time. Faster only with he added. Cargas said that he had three years. He hoped that Vilden would not let him down. He asked to focus on the fact that it will cost a lot of money. Cargas said that would be enough. Vilden wondered what it was. A scroll describing the Arden family's breathing technique, Cargas replied. He said that when he saw the result, he would give Vilden a strength training scroll. Vilden was shocked that it was a real scroll. I'll do my best, Vilden shouted. Cargas noted that he had always served him diligently and that he would need him again in the future. Of course, your honor, I swear eternal loyalty to you, said Vilden. Cargas said that he was a reliable person, so he would trust him. Ethan finished reviewing Vilden's memories. I shouldn't have, he said. This is the idea. Ethan mused that he thinks he's a king. He knew that Cargas didn't trust Vilden very much because Vilden had retained the memory sphere. Ethan asked Hans to report back. He told me that Myers had taken care of everything. Hans also added that they took the misappropriated money. Ethan asked what their leader's fate was. Myers tied Vilden up. Hans said Myers took care of him. He asked if he needed to bring Vilden. Ethan said it wasn't necessary. He thought a memory sphere was enough. Side families have appropriated secret techniques from Rhoda and tried to harm the direct descendants, not to mention the connection with games, murder, underground business. Ethan thought. He was sure that there was plenty of evidence. Ethan knew the time wasn't right yet. Ethan thought that the Baron was the weakest of the ten side families. He was aware that in his condition, it would be too hard to fight the knights. Using the resonance mana, I sowed the flame seeds and started to fill them, the duke mused. Ethan was thinking that right now, he only had enough mana left on his wrist. Head, neck, back, chest, shoulders, pelvis, thighs, ankles. When the last mana center in the heart starts circulating, Ethan continued to think. Getzog knew that he would deal with Cargas first. Ethan asked Hans to hide the memory sphere. He also added that Hans can keep the money for himself. Hans was overjoyed. You'd better forget what you saw today, if life is precious, Ethan said. I didn't see anything, said Hans, startled. Archduke. Cargas shouted. He was outraged that Ethan had destroyed his source of income. I've been in bed for ten years, and now. He continued. Cargas was very angry that Ethan had royal immunity. Maybe just kill him. Cargas mused. He knew that by doing so, he would be exposed for sure, and the Senate would throw all the sins on him. Cargas thought about laying low. He hoped that by the time of the meeting that would be held in two months, he would come up with something. A subordinate brought him a letter from Hans. Cargas snatched it out of his subordinate's hands. It seems that this is not a mistake. What should I do? The subordinate asked. Is he completely out of his mind? Cargas shouted. It was the one that Hans had asked for a hundred gold pieces to be sent to him. Cargas was furious. He told his subordinate to send the money to Hans and make sure he doesn't deceive me. Cargas continued. We are moving forward to three days after the last events. The plot takes place in the Arden hunting estate. 
Great, half of the mana centers in your hands are full, Ethan mused. Hans asked him if he was still asleep. Ethan told him to come in. Hans entered his room. I hope you slept well, Ethan's subordinate said. Hans was talking about Myers and the Archduchess waiting for him in the dining hall. Ethan headed for the dining hall. Looks like the repairs are almost done, the Duke asked. Hans said that the Red Scorpions had more money than he thought, so they expanded their budget. It's still not our gold, Ethan said. He added that part of Hans can afford. The subordinate thanked him. Ethan saw the Archduchess in a dress. He said it suited her very well. The Chamberlain did a good job, Ethan's sister replied. Hans didn't waste any time. Now we're like the Duke's family, Ethan thought to himself. He noted that he does everything to ensure that his sister eats and dresses well. Ethan asked Myers how his wound was. He said it would heal in the next week. Next, Ethan said. He was glad of that. His sister was surprised by his reaction. Ethan asked Myers and his sister if they were familiar with the ancestral ceremony for which the estate was built. The Archduchess said it was the first time she had ever heard of such a thing. Do they really not know in this reality? Ethan thought to himself. He informed Hans that they would go hunting in Pushks. The subordinate said that he would order everyone to gather. Ethan said it was just the four of them. Me, Nurse Myers, and you, Ethan would say. Hans was shocked by the news. The plot tells us that a week has passed. We are watching the Pushks Mountains. The boys were moving forward. Hans was furious. Hell of a week, he thought to himself. Nasty monsters have been attacking us since day one, Hans mused. I lost count of how many times I thought I was going to die. Hans kept thinking. He knew that without Ethan, he would have been lost. Ethan hit the monster with his sword. Hans was thinking that the Duke was throwing himself at them on purpose. Hans, stay out of the way, shouted Myers. He said he wasn't doing it on purpose. Hans hoped Ethan would train his brother when they got back. I don't want to go through this again, Hans thought. Myers asked if they had arrived at their destination. Ethan said they'd arrived at the Temple of Fire. Many centuries ago, this place was found by one of our ancestors. Since then the Arden family has always held farewell ceremony and blessing ceremonies here, the Duke reflected. The plot tells us about how the blessing of fire took place. Usually, the children of the Arden family are brought here at the age of 10 to meet the fire spirits. Ethan said that the energy they get from the spirits helps them get used to the fire. Also, he added that this is a traditional ritual, thanks to which you can master the flame. Hans called Ethan. He asked if he was sure he could come here. Hans said this place looks suspicious. Ethan said he could come here. So you'll know which side to choose, Ethan thought. The Duke said that there was a ceremonial altar in front of them. Ethan said it was very simple. We make offerings to the spirits. If you see the fire, dance, the Duke continued. Myers and his sister were taken aback. Do whatever you want to keep it bright and visible, Ethan continued. He said that by doing so, the spirits would give them a blessing. Just like that. Myers asked, and Herzog said it was. Ethan was amazed that the history of the past 15 years was different, not to mention the past. The Ardens signed a contract hundreds of years ago, but here it has already been terminated. The young Duke thought to himself. He knew that then he would have to cope without the blessing. Ethan told them to get started. The Duke turned to the fire spirits. We are descendants of the Ardens, and we have come to give gifts, light fires, and dedicate a dance to you, Ethan continued. Report. The Duke shouted. The fire spirits appeared before them. Ethan realized that he had finally opened the door. The fire spirits are here, he thought. Descendants of the Ardens. The fire spirit said. Myers was chosen by an Ifrit, mid-level, the Duke mused. The fire spirit invited Ethan's sister to play. Sister Salamander, low-level, he continued to think. The fire spirits were shocked by Ethan's presence. In my previous life, I was a fire lord. Ethan thought to himself. He was waiting for someone to bless him. The Duke was taken aback. It was the Empress herself who decided to bless Ethan. The spirit is much stronger than in my previous life. The Duke thought. The blood of the Arden family. The Empress cried out. Ono ordered them to bow down. The Empress asked Ethan if he had summoned her. The Duke said so. Grant me your blessing, Fire Emperor. No, Ethan said. The main character found himself in an unfamiliar place. He didn't know where he was. The Fire Empress appeared in front of him. This is your inner world, she said. The Fire Empress introduced herself. Her name was Rorosha. So be it, I'll take pity and give you my blessing. But were you trying to control my flames? Rorosha asked. Gotcha, Ethan thought to himself. He apologized to her. I thought it would be a good idea to join forces, the Duke continued. Ethan thought the Fire Lord's name was pretty cute. You're funny, Rorosha said. She said she would give him a chance. If you can master even a bit of my power, the blessing will be much better for you. The Fire Lord was saying. Rorosha wanted to see what Ethan was capable of. 
he accepted her offer. The Archduchess was very worried about whether Ethan would be okay. He's been on fire for over an hour, but he still hasn't moved, she continued. I'm only sure that something is going on. Myers replied. He believed that Ethan would definitely be able to handle everything. Concentrate. Remember how you felt when you could control the fire, the main character thought to himself. Use the black flame breath. He continued to think. Ethan still managed to master the power of the Fire Lord. He was very happy about it. Your Majesty, it looks like I won, Ethan said. Rorosha was surprised that someone was able to handle a bit of her power. You're a funny little man, she added. Rorosha talked about keeping her promise. She'd given Ethan a piece of her power. When I learned to control the flame, I learned that it could purify every vein, Ethan thought. He felt very hot. Ethan was filled with the power of the Fire Lord. Myers didn't understand what was going on with his brother. The Duke has gained a new power. Rorosha asked if he was satisfied. Yes, but I'd like to ask you to bless these two, Ethan added. The Fire Lord agreed with him. To be blessed by me personally is a great honor, ardent blood, Rorosha said. Myers and his sister received Rorosha's blessing. I think I'll see you again, she added. The Fire Lord said she was having fun. See you again, child of fire, she added. Ethan was surprised by the coincidence. The Duke was glad that his body was stronger and his veins were almost completely cleansed. He thought that in this state, he would be one of the strongest on the continent. Ethan knew that his sister and brother would need more time. I'll wait until they get the flames under control, Ethan thought. Hans couldn't believe that the Fire Lord was in front of his eyes. The Archduke is a monster in his own right, and now that he has the blessing, I can see why he brought me here, Hans mused. He was confident in choosing his side. The nurse didn't recognize Myers. Sister, you've changed too, Myers said. Ethan told them that the blessing of fire changes everything. Bones, muscles, veins, the Duke continued. So you might feel different now, Ethan added. Myers was surprised by the abrupt change. Ethan was extremely happy that they had received the blessing of the Overlord himself. I'm lucky I still have memories from my previous life, Ethan thought to himself. Myers asked his brother if it was normal for them to be so hungry. Ethan said it had to do with completely rebuilding their bodies. He called them to follow him. The Duke said he knew a place. The boys came out of a local tavern. I'm so full. That's right, Myers said. He didn't expect that there would be a rest house near the temple. I managed to turn around at full speed, said Hans. Myers asked where they were going now. He asked Ethan what he had decided to surprise them with. A passageway opened up in front of them. Myers asked what kind of place it was. This is where they keep their hunting loot, Ethan said. The boys turned their attention to the spell. A spell that protects things from damage. The Duke mused. He thought that there was something useful stored here. Hans was shocked by his discovery. Hans, did you find something? Ethan asked. Hans said he found a peacock skin. Yes, all the girls of the capital dream of such a thing. But it's impossible to get it, the subordinate continued. He noted that it was of very good quality. Ethan asked how much the leather could be sold for. It all depends on demand. At least 30 platinum, Hans added. That's 3,000 gold pieces. Myers shouted. Ethan had asked him to keep his cool, since he was a member of the Duke's family. Myers pouted. Ethan thought that the money might come in handy in the future. I didn't know you knew anything about it, the Duke said. Hans told him that his father was a merchant, so he traveled all over the kingdom as a child. He said that he wanted to help his father, but ended up here. Ethan reflected that he had his own reasons. Then I'll leave it to you, the Duke said. He asked Hans to find a reliable merchant. Ethan asked me to take this and leave. Hans said he would try. We are once again transported to the Arden family's domain. Hans asked if he could come in. Yes, of course, the Duke replied. The subordinate told Ethan that he had found a sales team that was willing to buy everything. He added that their representative is here now. Ethan asked which group they were talking about. Messes, Hans replied. The Duke was alarmed. They are considered the most enterprising. Is something wrong? Hans asked. The Duke praised him. He offered to meet with a representative. Hans was taken aback. A representative came through the door. He apologized for the delay. Allow me to introduce myself, the representative said. I'm Michelin, the head of the Mrs. Trading Group, he continued. I ask you to use your real name. Business relations should be built on trust, do you agree? Ethan asked. Michelin didn't know what he was talking about. My father told me that there is a tradition in the family of the Marquis of Besses. The future head of the family must live completely independently for several years, Ethan said. The Duke suggested that this was why he was hiding his true identity. Michelin said he was being confused with someone else. Ethan asked if Toto would continue to hide behind the mask. For three years now, I have lived independently of my family. Hiding my identity, my voice so unrecognizable that even the king would not have guessed, Michelin reflected. 
Ethan was starting from the memories of his past life, in which he told everything. The rep told Ethan that he was very perceptive. He suggested that he start over. Jaron Bessis, he said. Ethan talked about how nice it was to meet you. The Duke offered to start negotiations. I don't think you've ever encountered what I have to offer you, Ethan would say. The Duke asked Jaron if he was interested in making potions. Jaron was surprised that Ethan understood them. Well, it just so happens that I found out about it by pure chance, the Duke said. In the past life, in order to resist the dragons, many families shared their secret techniques. One of them was potion making, Ethan thought. The Duke reasoned that only he and the person who developed it knew the recipe. Ethan understood that Marquis Bess's family had given all their money to his family. I don't trust anyone else as much as I trust them, he thought. Ethan waited for Jared's decision. The representative didn't understand why the Duke had spoken so harshly about Potion. Intrigued by such a serious offer, since he knows about my real identity, it is unlikely that he will deceive, said Jaron. Ethan asked why his family had been chosen 15 years ago to help out during the Dragon War. The two families that have contributed the most are ruined and without influence, and the miserable parasites that have been hiding in the shadows are feasting on the corpses of the fallen, the Duke said. Ethan added that he couldn't trust them with such information. The Duke told Jaron that in seven months, he will officially become the head of the family, during which time he plans to get rid of all traitors. Ethan was hoping for the support of Jaron's family. Didn't he just wake up from ten years of coma recently? Jaron mused. The representative knew that Ethan's path would be blocked not only by the Senate, but also by the seven great families of the kingdom. They envy the Ardens their immunity, and the title of Defenders of the Realm, he continued to think. And that's why they support the Senate, which is destroying the kin from within, Yaron thought. The representative understood that if he chose the Archduke, he would become an enemy of the king who didn't want to give him immunity, the great family, and the ten senators. I understand your doubts, but it's a good deal, Ethan said. Jaron was taken aback. The Duke cut his hand with a knife. The rep asked what Ethan was doing. He told him not to worry. Ethan was talking about how he wanted to showcase his product. The Duke noted that this potion was as effective as the lesser healing potion. But the cost is only a tenth of the usual amount, Ethan added. Jaron was shocked by the potion's low price. Yes, but it is important to measure the amount of herbs and fermentation time very accurately, said Herzog. Ethan said he knew other recipes. The Duke told Jaron that if he accepted his offer, he would share them for free. Ethan asked what the entrepreneur thought about it. Decide now, Lord Jaron, the Duke continued. The entrepreneur understood that he had no way to restore the former greatness of his family. I won't just watch her die in silence, he thought. Jaron said he was willing to sign a contract with the Arden family. Hans was in a hurry to break the news of the past three days. On cases of breach of contract with vassals, first of all, Baron Cargas has more soldiers than allowed, Hans said. Ethan's subordinate noted that groups like the Red Scorpion had sprung up all over the city, and the total number of fighters was three times what was allowed. Secondly, he collects attacks from the residents of the increased tax, exploits them with help. Their groups, calling it protection, Hans added. Ethan was very angry because Cargas threatened the residents and charges them for protection. Ousted me with my brothers and robbed ordinary people, the Duke thought. Ethan assumed that the other nine families were no better. He asked Hans to look at the papers. Ethan asked about who exactly collected taxes in the villages. Hans said it was the Philistine Himes who did it. He added that Himes is a trusted confidant of Baron Cargas. The Duke asked where he was. Hans assumed that Toto was in the village of Burroughs. Ethan's subordinate added that it was about time for the gathering. Ethan said they needed to go to Burroughs. Hans said he'd get everything ready. I thought I could finish off the Baron's family in about four months, but with the Fire Lord's help, I need to move faster, the Duke mused. Be patient, Cargas, I'll deal with Himes first, Ethan kept thinking. Hames greeted the people of Barassas. I hope you have prepared the money. He continued to say. Master, we've collected everything we had, but we're still a little short, the old man said. Himes was angry. He told the old man that he already owed 20 gold pieces. Do you think I'll turn a blind eye to this? Hames shouted. I even dealt with the red scorpions for you. He continued. Lying pig, everyone knows his lordship did it, the old man thought. Give us a little more time, he said. Himes said it was too late. If you don't have any money, give me your daughter. He said, Himes added something that will show what the consequences are for people who do not pay taxes in time. Please, master, the old man said. He begged him not to take his daughter. Hans pointed at Himes. I already knew from afar that you were just a pathetic worm, Ethan was saying angrily. Himes turned his attention to Hans. And next to him, who is it? He thought to himself. Ethan exuded a powerful aura. Hames told Dakin to sort it out. 
What is this burning mana? That's right, he mused. Dakin ordered them to stop. He will be punished by law for disobeying the Baron if you get any closer. He continued. Dakin knew that Ethan's mana was low, but he was still under tremendous pressure. According to the law, Ethan was saying. The Duke told Dakin not to make him laugh. I don't want to hear this from robbers, the main character added. You dare threaten us. Dakin shouted. You want to die? He added. Ethan told Dakin that only he would die. Dakin was amazed at his speed. But the trajectory is simple. He continued to think. Dakin was counting on blocking his strike and then attacking. Ethan continued his attack. Dakin was shocked. He changed his trajectory in the middle of an attack. Dakin thought, surprised. Ethan struck him down with his sword. Dakin fell to the ground. Dust rose around Ethan. It can't be, I beat the knight with one blow, the guy said. The knight was amazed at Ethan's handling of the huge sword. He's clearly on a different level, the man added. Himes ordered his subordinates to stop him. Hans told them not to try. This is Archduke Arden himself, he added. Hans ordered them to lay down their weapons and surrender. The one who destroyed the red scorpions, said the knights. They laid down their weapons. Ethan said that knights know their place. What about you, Himes? The duke asked. He invited Himes to speak in private. Himes was very frightened. We are transported to Maruko City, the Himes mansion. You're even better off than I am, and you're doing pretty well, Ethan would say. Himes said it wasn't his fault. Hames had said that the blame lay entirely with Baron Cargas. He ordered me to collect more taxes. Everything is recorded in the accounting book that you keep, continued Himes. Ethan reasoned that he had enough proof. The Duke called Hans. He said that he wrote everything down in the memory sphere. Okay, so when you're done here, give this scroll to Baron Cargas, Ethan said. Hans obeyed the Duke's order. Ah, that's right. The Baron ordered more taxes to be collected rather than stuffed. Make sure he doesn't go back to his vile business again. Ethan continued. Hans asked Himes if he understood. He was very scared. So the Archduke is pressing us to build up power before the Senate meeting and bring everyone to their knees, am I right? Said the man. He told Cargas to start acting. The man added that they needed to know more about Ethan. He asked me to let him know if he found out anything. Cargas was furious. Pitiful worm. Cargas thought. He was very angry because they were trying to bait him. Ethan's letter stated that Cargas broke the vassal contract and collected more taxes. Cargas didn't understand how Ethan had dealt with the tax collectors. They were accompanied by knights. He continued to think. Cargas knew there was no other way. He called his butler. Send Ruin to the shack. Have him invite the Archduke to my mansion. That's right, Cargas said. He knew he couldn't underestimate Ethan anymore. I'll meet you and sort it out in person. He continued to think. Ethan was glad that he had dealt with almost every tax violation in recent weeks. He was sure that Cargas was furious. There was a knock on Ethan's door. The Duke said to come in. Myers asked his brother if he had called him. Ethan told Myers to get ready because they were going to a side family soon. He said he had a request from Myers. The younger brother didn't understand what was being said. What other family? What is it? He asked. Ethan told him not to worry. I'll explain everything now, the Duke added. Ethan had told Myers that there were three reasons why he would send him there. Three, said the younger brother. First of all, as you already know, after Terran left, there were only two candidates for the position of head of the clan, he said. But I don't think the other families will watch me destroy Cargas in peace, the main character continued. Ethan added that he is immune to what they are powerless to do. Secondly, they want to maintain their influence and will be against me becoming the head, the Duke continued. He told Myers that because of this, they would try to promote him and make him a puppet. The younger brother understood that they had already tried to do this. Third, if they think you're on their side, they'll give you all the support they can, Ethan said. Myers said he understood. The Duke said they would cross the Rubicon. Ethan told Myers that anything could happen to him. The younger brother understood what he was trying to say. Myers reassured him that everything was fine. The Duke thanked him. So you just have to pretend that I'm on their side and enlist their support. The younger brother asked. Ethan said that as long as they supported him, they wouldn't interfere so actively. He added something that will be prepared for their destruction. The target is one of the most powerful family, Count Furness, the Duke continued. Ethan had told Myers that Hans was coming with him, so he didn't have to worry. Myers said he could handle it. His subordinates were preparing Myers' belongings for departure. The Archduchess asked if he was really leaving. What? Myers asked. She told him to answer her question. Just like that, without any preparation, leaving for half a year, said the indignant sister. Myers apologized to her. He said he would try to write more often. Yeah, try, she said. Ethan asked him to wait a bit. He said he believed in him and always did. But be careful, his brother added. Myers was confused. Myers told Ethan to rely on him. 
He said he was on his way. The mayor's driver pulled out. My sister and Ethan watched Myers drive away. On the way, they met another carriage. They drove past him. The cart hit a rock. The young man was surprised by the local roads. Really, is the Baron worth this torment? The guy added. The young man said that he would definitely tell the Baron what they had been through. By the way, how much did he send out this month? What is it? He asked. Not stingy, a hundred gold pieces, the guy replied. The young man was shocked by the amount of money. Wasn't there just one gold piece last month? What is it? The surprised youth asked. He was furious that the Baron had cut his budget when he lost at carts and sent a hundred gold coins to those pathetic worms. Listen, Shuron, he said. The subordinate was waiting for an order. The young man offered to leave him ten gold pieces. He said that ten gold pieces was a decent price to pay for his suffering. The subordinate handed the youth ten gold coins. We'll leave ten to those worms, he said. The young man said that they would keep the rest for themselves. He was counting on having fun with this money. What if the Archduke gets angry? What is it? A puzzled subordinate asked. They say he's stronger than some knights, the subordinate continued. Shuron noted that the Baron himself had said to be careful. That's ten times more than last time, the youth continued. He asked why the Duke should be angry. The young man said that the Duke is not a hindrance to him. I'm a third-ranked knight, he continued. Ethan lost himself in the memories that bound him to his brother. Don't worry, go, my brother would say. I will defend this place until my last breath, until you defeat the Dragon King, he continued. Ethan was working out. He wondered if Terran was all right. I haven't heard from you since I woke up, and I understand how you feel, the Duke mused. He thought that Terran had done everything he could to keep his family together. He was annoyed that he didn't know anything about this situation. I wish I could just take you back to the family, Ethan thought, frustrated. He strikes hard at the training dummy. Ethan cut him in half. But I doubt it will be easy, and that makes me even angrier, the Duke continued to think. He noticed that someone was driving up to his house. The mayor's driver ordered her to stop. A subordinate told the youth that they had arrived. Oh, my God, do you have to live in such a remote place? Oh, he said, irritated. Ethan wondered who it was. I am the one who brought the allowance from Baron Cargas, the young man replied. He asked Ethan what he would say to that. I bet you didn't expect to see so much money, he continued. Ethan noticed the money lying on the ground. Look, the beggar is speechless at the sight of gold, said the young man. He didn't understand why he had to bow down to the Duke's family. What, you can't even say thank you for such generosity, he added. The young man said that the Baron only gave one gold coin last month. Ethan hit him. He asked if he had misheard. Since when did the Baron become more important than the Duke? Ethan was saying. The young man was shocked by his actions. Tell me again. Who are you? Ethan said, enraged. Cargas, said the frightened youth. What's Cargas? The Duke asked. Baron Cargas, he kept saying. Ethan slapped him hard across the face. He began to yell in pain. You're crazy. Stop it. The young man shouted. Die. Oh, he cried. The young man started to activate his technique. Ethan didn't understand what he was trying to do. This is Aura. He also studied our breathing technique, the Duke reasoned. The boy was talking about breaking Ethan's arms. But how pathetic, Ethan thought. They obviously know her, but they don't reveal much of her potential, are they self-taught? He kept thinking. Ethan was glad that he knew the technique for blocking. He activated it on the youth. The Duke tossed it aside. He was shouting about how he didn't even feel Ethan's attack. The young man was taken aback. What's going on? That's right, said the frightened young man. He was asking Ethan what he'd done to him. The Duke said that he had sealed his mana. Sealed it? The young man asked. Of course a tech thief would know how they work, Ethan continued. The young man shouted at him not to joke with him like that. Ethan dodged the blow. Then Ethan attacked him again. He glanced at his subordinate. He asked him for what purpose they had come. A subordinate handed over an invitation from Baron Cargas. Also, he didn't send you ten gold pieces, but a hundred, he added. Ethan ordered him to put everything in a bag. The latter, in turn, listened to his instructions. An invitation. And I thought he was going to throw it out, Ethan reasoned. He found that there was an invitation to a private meeting listed. Ethan knew it would only serve him right. Actions take us to the next day. The nurse asks Ethan if he's sure everything's going to be okay. He told her not to worry, because Cargas had just invited him to talk. The Archduchess started to say something, but Ethan cut her off in mid-sentence. He told her that he was moving out. Don't worry, I'll be right back, the Duke added. The mayor's driver ordered her to move. Ethan's sister wanted to ask him why he needed the sword if he was just going to talk. The Baron's fate is already sealed, no matter what he thinks, Ethan thought. But if you're determined to be a pain in the ass to the end, let's see what he does, the Duke continued to think. The plot tells us that Ethan arrived in the city of Poerig. He knew that he had finally reached the Baron. 
It was too much of a palace for a city like this, Ethan thought to himself. The Duke thought that behind these buildings he was hiding the suffering of people, blaming his family for everything. And we've shed blood on the battlefield for people like that, Ethan thought. The coachman informed the Duke that they had arrived. Hey, so you're the guest, said the man. He added what he had been telling his father to spend on all this time. Where is my little brother who was sent for you? What is it? The man asked. Ethan asked him if he knew who he was talking to. Or did the Baron not even teach you respect for the main family? The Duke added. Aren't you acting too brazen just because of the title? What is it? He asked. Am I being blatant? Ethan asked with a smirk on his face. The man asked if he was amused. Ethan kicked him. The man flew far away from him. It's ridiculous that such a pathetic worm would want to teach me anything, the Duke replied. The man didn't understand what had happened. I was hit. He thought to himself. He was surprised that he didn't even have time to notice. Ethan told him to pick up his brother. He asked if Ethan had done this to him. Who else is there? The Duke asked. The man drew his sword. Pitiful worm. Stop it. He shouted. I'll kill you. The man continued to yell. Is this one the same? Ethan thought to himself. The Duke reasoned that they couldn't learn the basics of the technique. Ethan activated his technique. The man was shocked. He didn't understand how he could have missed. Where did he go? He continued to think. Ethan attacked him from behind. The Duke slammed his face into the ground. Ethan said a man didn't deserve to be called a knight. He said he would finish it with the next punch. Stop it now. Stop it. The young man shouted. Someone was attacking Ethan. The Duke dodged his attack. I am Menharten, commander of the Knights of Baron Cargas, he said. Menharten said Ethan had crossed the line. Be reasonable and stop. Don't force me to use force. The knight continued. Ethan was annoyed. Did I cross the line? The Duke asked. And you, who raised your sword against the Archduke, the heir of the main family, don't. Ethan continued. The knight was taken aback. Okay, Silu, so Silu, try to block the next blow, the Duke said. Ethan added that if Menharten was threatening to use force, he had to be stronger than that pathetic worm. In that case, please excuse me, Menharten replied. He launched his attack. Ethan was taken aback. The Duke deflected the knight's attack. Menharten attacked again. A fierce battle was taking place between them. He's good, Ethan thought. The Duke repelled his attack again. The knight grazed Ethan with his sword. We must push him back, the Duke thought. Menharten attacked from above. Ethan was waiting. Menharten kicked up the dust. Ethan was baffled. I blocked his view. Now I can neutralize him without seriously injuring him, the knight mused. Through the dust, Menzarten saw the sword. He was shocked. Ethan hit him with his sword. He's going to kill me, the knight thought. Ethan stopped his attack. Menharten was shocked. He didn't understand why Ethan had stopped his attack. He knew it would have hit him. Did you really spare me? The knight continued to think. Ethan waited for further action. Suddenly, they heard a scream. Ruin. The woman screamed. The subordinate said it was dangerous to be here. Baby, open your eyes. The woman continued to shout. She was furious. How dare a half-dead duke touch my son? No, she said. The woman ordered Ethan captured. Commander, why are you standing up? What is it? She asked. That's enough. Cargas shouted. He was heading with his subordinates in his direction. He was angry. The woman said Ethan beat up her sons. Cargas said he knew everything. He said he'd figure it out for himself. Cargas asked her to leave. He ordered Mahartan to take care of his wife and ruin. He obeyed his orders. It's been ten years since I've seen you. Your grace, can you let my son go so we can talk? Cargas asked. Yes, it's been a long time. For many reasons, Ethan would say. He said he couldn't fulfill Cargas' request. Great is the sin of the one who raised the sword against the duke, the duke continued. Ethan said his son was going to be executed. Cargas asked Ethan to calm down. Dexter, I apologize on behalf of my son, the baron added. You may be immune, but the duke's authority has long been an empty phrase, Cargas said. He'd told Ethan that the senate was now in charge of these lands, and they will judge my son, Cargas continued. He suggested that Ethan settle all the misunderstandings and join forces to make his family great again. Baron Helmut, if the duke's family doesn't run the duchy, then why would you even exist, Ethan would say. Dexter, Cargas shouted. Ethan stuck his sword in the ground, right next to Dexter's face. Cargas was very frightened. Stop trying my patience, the Baron shouted. If you want to live, let go of my son and beg on your knees for forgiveness, said the enraged Baron. Ethan told him not to make him laugh. The Duke said he had decided to get rid of his entire family. He said that Helmut broke the vassal contract. To cover up their crimes, they threatened the Duke's descendants, Ethan added. The Duke said that the Baron was accused of treason and should be stripped of all rights, title and castle. How dare a tr- What is it? said the enraged Baron. He ordered his subordinates to deal with Ethan. 
The Baron had ordered them to act according to his plan, telling them to do everything possible so that the Duke could not interfere with him anymore. I knew you had something hidden, Ethan would say with a grin on his face. He called the Baron a pathetic worm. The plot tells us about Palantium. This is the capital of the Kingdom of Hyder. The head asked if there were any other topics. Or can we end the meeting? He continued. Your Majesty, I would like to say something, Bloaton was saying. He asked if they would let him say that. It's strange why the Marquis suddenly decided to discuss something, the head thought. I allow it, he told him. The Archduke, the one who was in a coma for ten years after releasing his mana, the Marquis was saying. The chief was thinking about when the Duke had any dealings with the Bessus. He asked what the occasion was. He said that Baron Cargas broke the vassal contract, the Marquis replied. He added that the violation occurred more than once. He raised taxes, created secret groups and outnumbered the army, and misappropriated and sold information about the Seven Dukes' secret techniques. Bloaton continued. I thought so. The Seven families are not happy about this discussion, the head mused. The Marquess added that all the evidence was recorded on the memory spheres, and Ethan insisted on fiscating the castle. It's not an easy decision to side with the Seven families that support the Senate or join the legendary defenders of the kingdom. The head of state mused. He said it wasn't in his area of expertise. The head of state said that the Ardens are not members of the Senate, so if this is a problem only for his family, then he will not interfere. The head told the Archduke to handle everything himself. The Marquis promised to pass on his words. So the king hadn't chosen the Ardens' side, the Marquis thought. Menharton asked Karga's wife to calm down, because it was safe here. He asked a subordinate to close the window and bring hot tea. The subordinate said that he would comply with his request. Manhartan said he was going to see the Baron. The Baron's servant asked him to be careful. He started toward them. Manhartan didn't understand why Ethan had changed his mind in the middle of the attack. He had a bad feeling about this. Karga's subordinates attacked the Duke. Their attacks continued and continued. Gotcha. Karga's subordinate shouted. Ethan dodged his attack. The Duke was furious. They attacked the main character from two sides. Ethan took action. That's it, attack at the same time and don't let them dodge. Kargas shouted. The knight informed the baron that his son and wife were safe. Very well, Menharton, the baron replied. He said he wouldn't need any more help. No, the archduke doesn't deliberately attack as if he's looking down on them, the knight thought. Ethan leapt up and hovered over Kargas' subordinates. 18, 19, done, Ethan said. The knights were hit by the shockwave from Ethan's attack. Where did he learn such a move? Kargas asked, surprised. The duke continued his attack. You can't win if you just run away. The baron shouted. He shouted that he would throw Ethan into the dungeon. And not for ten years, but for life. He added. Ethan froze, waiting. He added that the next attack will be with a large radius, so the duke does not want to hurt too much. Ethan activated his technique. Strong flames appeared around the entire manor. What is this monstrous energy? Yes, said the astonished baron. Ethan was preparing to attack. His sword was burning with a bright flame. Menharton was taken aback. The terrified knight ordered everyone to dodge. The duke activated the Arden's secret technique, the second form. The knights were hit by a shock wave. The archduchess was burned by the tea she had just made. She was worried about Ethan being okay. I hope this time there will be no nonsense, she said. The sister noted that the main character was always reckless. Not hearing their belligerent shouts outside the window is so unusual, the archduchess continued. Shouts filled the battlefield. The knight couldn't believe Ethan would use this technique, given his low mana pool. The entire area was covered by a shock wave. The Baron's subordinates fell. Menharton came to Karga's defense. How is this even possible? Thought the frightened Baron. These are elite knights, each of whom can handle a couple of thousand soldiers, and we will take them down with one blow, Karga's continued to think. Ethan stopped attacking. He was concerned that he had almost no mana left. He noted that if he didn't have the Fire Lord's blessing, he would have already been unconscious. Baron Helmut, your turn, the Duke would say. Ethan said that for all his family, he would be severely punished. The Baron continued to ask for help from his knights. He's definitely exhausted by now. Whoever kills the Duke will get 500 gold. Kargas was saying, startled. As if that were possible, his attack wasn't just powerful. A huge wave of fire only hit those he wanted, something he'd never seen before, Menharton thought. The knight knew that absolutely everyone had seen what Ethan was capable of, so no one in their right mind would go after him. Ethan turned his attention to Menharton. The duke asked him if he would like to repeat their fight. I've already lost to you, the chagrin knight replied. Ethan asked if Kargas had heard him. The duke attacked the baron. Your grace, Menharton shouted. Ethan ordered the knight to lock Karas in a dungeon and keep an eye on him. He was shocked by his request. Are you suggesting that you throw your own master in the dungeon? 
The knight asked, puzzled. He was telling Ethan that he had sworn an oath to the Baron. Yes, a loyal knight, that's why I'm entrusting you, the duke said. He told Menharton that the Baron was a traitor who would lose his title for his crimes. If he tries to escape, his entire family will be executed in accordance with the law, Ethan added. A loyal knight must not forget his oath, said the knight. He said that he would follow his orders. Do you think you can get away with this? Cargus shouted. He ordered the knight to release him. The Baron continued to call out to Merhenton. He ordered the door opened. You can do it all by yourself, Ethan said. The knight asked the duke if he could ask him a question. Everyone, including me, attacked you on the Baron's orders, so why did you spare some of them? The knight asked. Ethan was talking about the sword being a reflection of a knight's soul, and he asked if Menharton had ever heard of knights speaking the language of blades. The duke told him that when he woke up, he was surrounded by equally nasty people. He added that they only wanted his family to die, even though they were the ones who saved the country. But when I crossed swords with you, I realized that there are still people who respected this family, and I breathed a sigh of relief, the duke said. It doesn't matter if you're motivated by remorse or longing. Whatever the reason, there are people who are loyal to the duke's sword, Ethan continued. He added that this is quite enough. The duke noted that he was talking a lot. I'll leave this place to you, Menharton, Ethan said. The main character was in Baron Helmut's office. Hello, your grace, Raymond said. The duke was surprised. I am Raymond, the Baron's eldest son, he would say. Raymond said he was waiting for him. Waiting for the one who imprisoned your father and brothers, Ethan asked. The duke said he didn't know what his intentions were, but he warned Raymond to choose his words. Calm down, I'm not like my father and brothers, Raymond thought to himself. He asked if Ethan wanted to make a deal with him. A deal? The duke asked, pleased. I was wondering what you were going to say, but you still don't seem to understand the situation you're in, the duke said. Raymond was taken aback. Ethan said that deals are only made with people of equal status. The duke took him by the throat. Ethan said that the baron's family had committed treason and also raised a sword against him. Do you still think you have the right to bargain? Oh, said the enraged duke. Raymond thought about how I couldn't breathe. He knew that he had to say something, otherwise he might choke. Information about the seventh family, Raymond was saying breathlessly. Ethan ordered him to speak. He added that if he tries to deceive him, he will immediately go to jail. No, no, I really have information about them, Raymond said, trying to clear his throat. He handed Ethan the proof. These are agreements on the transfer of secret techniques, Raymond said. When House Arden was destroyed, the seventh great family demanded a book of secret techniques from the Duke's vassal, the Baron's son said. He added that all this was done for the sake of strengthening the army and countering threats to neighboring countries. Raymond was talking about how they had no choice but to give her up. Ethan asked him if the notes had helped the knights. We were never able to solve all the secrets. The seventh family sold us a simplified version, the Baron's son added. Ethan didn't know what she was talking about. Raymond had said that this was it. Give them the full version, and then buy a cut-down version from them, the Duke mused. He didn't understand how anyone could be... Raymond was saying that the price of decryption was too high, so they had to raise taxes. The Duke said that the version of this book was garbage. Raymond was shocked. Ethan told me that the most useless things are written in this book. No one in their right mind would share something so important, he continued. You were just used and taken away, Ethan added. War is a time to form alliances and unite, and in peacetime, everyone only cares about their own wallets, the Duke reflected. Ethan said he would spare the rest of Raymond's family. In return, I want to see all of the Baron's accounting books, he added. The Duke told Raymond to take them and wait for further instructions in the annex. Ethan found himself in a strange place. He didn't know where he was. I trained in the yard, he thought. A dragon tried to attack him. Ethan was shocked. Behind him was the knight who was hit by the dragon. I didn't get hurt, he mused. So these are memories from a previous life. The Duke continued to think. Cargus congratulated him on his victory. Ethan was shocked. It's Baron Cargus from my world. He thought. Cargus said Ethan should burn in hell. You burst into a peaceful world and destroy everything around you like a dragon, the Baron continued. Cargus. He asked him if Ethan thought it was the right thing to do. You're just an intruder, just like the ones you hate so much, the Baron was saying. He added that you cannot change the course of history as he pleases. Ethan was very scared. A wave of panic washed over him. No way, Ethan shouted. He attacked Cargus with his sword, but he just disappeared. Sister, Myers and Terran are alive. The Duke thought to himself. They're alive here. He continued to think. I don't care what you can and can't do. Ethan thought. He didn't care about the rest of the story. He was confident that he would protect his family at all costs. You can't do that. Stop it, the man shouted. The Duke was taken aback. He said the Archduke knew him. Let me see him. 
continued the man. He asked to see Ethan. Prixian. Ethan pleaded. The Duke asked if it was him. And Michelin is here, he added. Prixian was glad to see the Duke. In my previous life, they called him the document monster, Ethan thought. He recalled that Prixian was one of the key members of the Arden family, who rose from the very bottom to count by using his abilities. Almost any administrative task takes him no more than an hour, Ethan mused. Prixian told the Duke that all those who supported him would his colleagues lost their seats, including him. That explains why you're dressed like this, the Duke would say. Ethan was amazed that the head had fired all the useful people to destroy his family from the inside out. Perhaps they can think, the Duke thought. I was just thinking of someone to assign administrative tasks to, and Prixian showed up just in time, Ethan continued to think. He introduced Michelin to Prixian. He added that Prixian is a merchant who cooperates with the duchy. The merchant apologized to Michelin for the recent incident. Michelin noted that everything is in order. Your grace, you have so unexpectedly dealt with the baron's family, now the senate, Michelin said. I don't want to hear any more of this, the duke replied. Ethan said this land belongs to his family. Only if the king gives you back ownership. The baron's eldest son told me something, Michelin continued. He said that the vassals and the seventh great family had done something amazing. The duke repeated that it was their land. Do you think the Arden family's heir needs permission from some useless king? Ethan added. Michelin was surprised by his words. He was worried about the consequences that might affect the duke. Ethan told him not to worry. The duke said they would soon have good news. If you say so, then fine, Michelin replied. He said he was going on a mission for the duke. Prixian was glad that Ethan had recovered. Apparently, you will need a lot of smart people he added. Prixian talked about raising one child and he asked if Ethan would like to meet him. Do you have a child? The Duke asked in surprise. Prixian told him to come in. He told the Duke that his child was adopted, and he brought it with him. It is an honor to meet you, said the Prickison child. He said his name was Lawrence. Ethan was shocked. He recognized him as an acquaintance. The plot takes us to the Iron Valley. Ethan was at the head of the army. The man told him that all the troops were in position. You exceed expectations, as always, Sylvia, the Duke would say. She said it was nothing. In just a week, you've managed to develop a great strategy that will turn the tide of battle, Ethan noted. She said that the death squad played a crucial role. All that remains is to give the order to attack, Sylvia was saying, confused. The Duke added that Sylvia was the only one who could think of such a thing. He noted that she constantly found the best place for the cavalry to strike. And I appreciate your abilities, but you can't stay up for three days, Ethan added. If you pass out in the middle of a fight, I'll have to deal with everything myself, the Duke used to say. Sylvia said that after becoming a strategist, it is very difficult for her to accept the fact that someone died. But now that these monsters have almost wiped out humanity, I'm willing to put my life on the line if my strategy saves even one more person, she continued. Ethan was saying that it was time for them to put an end to these vile monsters and save humanity. The dragons are on the move, Ethan shouted. Do not miss the moment when to enter the infantry, added the main character. He ordered the horns to be blown. The knights began loading their catapults. Shells were placed in them. All troops to battle. Ethan screamed. The knights charged at the dragons. The plot tells us that on that day the battle was the toughest. Many knights died that day. But thanks to Sylvia's ingenious tactics, the humans managed to win despite the huge gap in strength. Ethan held her body in his arms. This battle was her last. We are transported back to our own time. Ethan was sure it was Sylvia. So why? She introduced herself as Lawrence. The Duke reasoned. He noticed that even the atmosphere was very different. Lawrence thanked the Duke for taking revenge on the Baron instead of him. He told Ethan that the Baron's massive taxes had killed his family. So history must have changed. Because of the decline of the Ardens and the beginning of the tyranny of the side families, the Duke continued to think. Prixian said his arrival was due to Lawrence's strong desire to see him. Let's see how talented this Lawrence guy is, Ethan thought to himself. Herzon told him that Prixian had recommended him. You must understand the current situation of the Baron's family, the Duke was saying. He asked Lawrence what to do with them. He offered to spare them and turn them into scarecrows. Why? Ethan asked. Even as a scarecrow Cargassi are still Cargassi, said Prixian's son. He added that other families will not be able to intervene if the clan is not destroyed. You can also keep a position with one of them in order to get a mole in the future, Lawrence continued. He added that many of them were forced out during the power struggle. And most importantly, there is a shortage of workers. You need to use everything you have, added Lawrence. Ethan said that he was talking about the future, and he was interested in the short-term perspective. Lawrence said the Duke needed an army. He was saying that he wouldn't be able to deal with the vassals alone. Prixian's son pointed out that he needed to put them together first. 
This will buy you time to prepare, he continued. When you have dealt with at least four, the dukedom will be divided into three parts, and the victory is in your pocket, said Lawrence. Ethan had no doubt that Lawrence was the epitome of Sylvia. The duke had told Prixian that he had raised a good child. What do you say, Lawrence? Ethan asked. Prixian's son didn't understand what was being said. He asked if Lawrence would be his advisor. We are shown a city that meets the dawn. The knights tied up all the criminals. The guy was thrown back by the impact into the barrels. Menharkin told him not to overdo it, because he would deal with him himself. The man shouted at Menharkin that he was a traitor. And you call yourself the Baron's Knight. Stop it, he shouted. The knight asked why he should hear this from him. The man added that they both learned breathing techniques. Also, he noted that they both served the Baron. He was no better. You are right, but it is the duty of a knight to correct the mistakes of his master, Menharton said. The man told him that he would betray by rushing at him with his fists. All you can do is bark, Menharton said. The knight slapped him across the face. It bounced off the wall. Menharton ordered him to be tied up and destroy the mana center. The advisor told the knight that he had done a good job. I was very surprised when I was told to obey someone I see for the first time, and on his orders to destroy the eight gates of darkness, the knight mused. Menharton thought of Lawrence as a professional who had planned everything out long ago. Who is he? He thought to himself. Lauren told them to move on to the next point before they understood. He was talking about how they still had seven left. Lawrence expected them to finish before nightfall. Counselor, did I hear you correctly? Lawrence asked. Prixian was talking about going out for a walk. Ethan and Lawrence were alone. Thank you for the offer, but I have to decline, Prixian's son told him. The Duke wanted to know the reason for the refusal. Lauren drooped. The truth is, I'm a girl, Lawrence would say. He talked about how his childhood was spent in the slums, and his family was commoners. A girl without an education is at the very bottom of society. You can't think of anything worse, she continued. My father thought the same way, before he died. He blamed not the Baron for exorbitant taxes, but his daughter, who could not become a knight, she said. It was all because she was a girl. She said that she could not earn money to pay taxes, so the collectors decided to sell her. But I couldn't leave my little brother, so all I had to do was go on the run, Lawrence continued. She added that she had to steal, but thinking about her brother helped her move on. But they took even that away from me, she continued. Lawrence said that she was found by the eight gates of darkness, so she lost her brother, whose name was Lawrence. She was upset that she had been looked down on all her life because she was a girl. There was no reason for her to live, because everything was taken away from her. When my brother died, I decided to start a new life under his name, she said. Lawrence was afraid that if they found out about her secret, everyone might think that she was selling her body. I'm sorry, but I can't be an advisor, Lawrence said, looking upset. Ethan said he didn't think so. Don't listen to this nonsense, the Duke shouted. He added that talent does not depend on gender. He told her to look forward proudly. If someone points a finger at you, break it, Ethan added. The Duke said that Eight Gates is an organization that Cargas created to collect super taxes. He thought this was a chance for revenge for her brother. You'll have a knight and a group of soldiers at your disposal, can you handle it? Yes, said the Duke. Lawrence said she needed one day to destroy them all. I'll wait for the results, Ethan said. The plot takes us to the city of Hermes. Myers said Furnace had an amazing office. You flatter me, he said. Furnace asked what had brought Myers to see him. In front of us was the head of the 10th collateral family, Count Shimon Furness. His lordship must be busy after he wakes up, Furness continued. Myers said that he thought his brother had become very strange. Shimon was taken aback. Myers asked Furness to look at him. He showed him his scars. Furness asked where they came from. Myers said it was his brother's fault. He added that he had done the same thing with hands. Ethan hits us every time he doesn't like something, the younger brother continued. Myers said he couldn't take it anymore. He was extremely surprised that Ethan was very quiet and calm as a child. Myers assumed that this was the result of the release of Mana. He thought that the Duke had become a completely different person. Really? Furness asked, surprised. Shimon thought that everything fits together. I haven't been able to contact Helmut for a few days now. It looks like Arden has taken action. Furness continued to think. He knew he was in no hurry, and he wanted to use Myers as part of his plan. Myers asked if Count Shimon was all right. Myers offered him a deal. Before us is the Count's estate. The Count asked Myers again. Yes, that's one of the reasons I came, he said. Myers noted what he had recently learned about side families and factionalism. And not all members of the Senate support each other, he said. Shimon didn't understand how he got this information. The side families are divided into two groups, each of which wants to gain the most influence in these lands, the Count continued to think. The first is the Amilton faction, headed by Count Lugon, and the second is the Furnace faction, headed by me, he thought. 
Shimon understood that the forces of the factions were almost equal, so each faction was waiting for the moment to attack. Myers said he learned more important information by doing so. Someone tried to turn me into a useless drunk and our family into a scarecrow, he said. Myers said it was all the work of Helmut Kargas. He added that Count Lugon had given the order to Kargas. Shimon was shocked. Myers' younger brother said that was why he came to see him. He added that the deal will be beneficial for both of them. What is this supposed to mean? Shimon thought. I thought someone had spilled the beans about our plan and come for revenge, the Count thought. He believed that Hans was behind it. If you can help me remove my crazy brother and become the head of the family, I'll help you get rid of Count Lugon, Myers said. He asked him what he thought of his offer. This opportunity must not be missed, Shimon thought to himself. The Count said Myers had come for a reason. He said that he would make every effort to make Myers a duke. Hans knocked on Shimon's door. The man told him to come in. He asked if the Count had called him. Shimon said he wanted to know something from him. I understand perfectly well who misinformed Myers. Why did you help me? What is it? He asked. The Count added that if the truth was revealed, Hans would be targeted. In truth, I am Baron Karga's Chamberlain, and I have come to you to protect the young master from his cruel brother, Hans said. The Count asked why he had addressed him and not the Baron. Hans said that the Archduke began to openly show aggression towards the Kargas family. He added that he could attack them at any time. And I'm not allowed to go to the other faction, so I just slightly changed the truth for young master, Hans added. The Count noted that Meyer's subordinate was a shrewd one. He added that he had done him a great service. Well done for coming to me and not to the Baron, Shimon said. The Count said that Helmut hadn't been in touch for a long time. Hans was terrified by this fact. Hans, right. The Count asked. He told him not to worry, because from now on, he was one of his people. Hans thanked him for his kindness. Shimon said it was nothing. However, without the Baron, it will not be easy to find out what the Archduke is up to, he said. Hans had offered to be a spy on the Archduke. You have generously accepted me, and now I want to prove my loyalty to you. Hans continued. He noted that he personally knows the Archduke and that he has connections. Hans said he might be useful. Shimon was extremely happy about this. So you can tell me what the Archduke is up to and when, the Count said. Hans confirmed his words. Shimon told Hans that he would keep in touch with him through the crystal ball. The Archduke's subordinate said to count on him. Hans left the Count's office. He thought that everything was going according to plan. Hans thought that Myers had done his part perfectly. We should try too. Hans continued to think. What do you say, Commander Loden? Said Shimon. He noted that it all sounds plausible, but too suspicious. Loden said he didn't see any danger yet, but they needed to be on their guard. The Count wanted to find out his intentions. Menharton thought that this was the first time he had encountered such a thing. I've seen a lot of things in my time as a knight, but I've never seen such a dangerous person in my life, the knight thought. What scared him was that Lawrence killed criminals without mercy. Lawrence was wiping the blood from his face. Menharton had told him that there was no point in going that far. I promised his lordship to wipe them out, he replied. The knight was intimidated by Lawrence's expression. The face was like a demon devouring children, the man said. He asked the guy if he was guarding prisoners. The man advised to be careful with Lawrence. The guy told him to be quiet. The devil, Lawrence asked, some new criminal group. He continued. Lawrence was telling the man that he had arrived with a report for the Archduke. Of course, come in, said the knight. He pointed out to Lawrence that Ethan was working out. The duke was practicing with his sword. He prepared to attack the dummy. Ethan jumped. He hit the target with his sword. The duke continued to strike until he cut her apart. Ethan cut all the targets into small pieces. He was lost in thought. The main character understood that training with dummies no longer made sense. Your grace, I'll report, said Lawrence. The duke asked if it was related to the previous conversation. Yes, there were some useful people at the eight gates, he said. Lawrence added that they could be turned into a good scouting team. Very well, said the duke. He asked if they were ready. Lawrence said half of it was ready. Sir, a man who introduced himself as Hans has arrived, the knight reported. The knight asked what he needed to say. This is my subordinate, let him come to my office, Ethan said. He also asked Lawrence to go to the study as well. It looks like he managed to infiltrate. Let's see if the plan worked, the duke mused. We find ourselves on the training ground at Kelmont Castle. Myers was engaged in a duel with other knights. The younger brother was ready for the next attack. Two knights surrounded him. They attacked him from both sides. Myers dodged the attack of one of the knights. But suddenly, he was attacked by a knight from behind. Myers blocked the attack with his shield. Shimon noted that his younger brother Ethan had very good skills. You can't be the head of the family, Loden said. The Count added that Myers had ardent blood in his talent. Make sure that Lugon doesn't know anything and follow the Archduke's every move, Shimon continued. 
Loden said he would do as he asked. The Count was counting heavily on him. Who would have thought that I would wait so long for the Senate meeting? The Count added. The Duke read hands. He was glad that Myers was doing well. He was also interested in the fate of the Count. Hans said that Shimon had no idea because they had done everything in the best possible way. Since I was sent to the Baron's estate, it will be much easier to pass on information to you, Ethan's subordinate continued. Are you already driving stakes between families? Lawrence asked. Ethan said it was true. Hans was shocked that Lawrence knew about their plans. He asked the Duke who the man was. Ethan introduced him to Lawrence. Discuss the details, you will soon have to work a lot together, the Duke added. The advisor said that he was pleased to meet you. I am Lawrence, his lordship's advisor, he continued. Fresh tea was placed in front of them. Hans was amazed that in just a week of his absence, the Duke had found someone so smart. He has such delicate features. Is he really his type? Hans mused. Hard, slow down. Ethan's subordinate continued to think. Lawrence didn't know what Hans was thinking with that expression on his face. You don't seem to like me, Monsieur Le Chamberlain, he said. Hans replied that this was not the case. He was only confused by Lawrence's age. Age doesn't matter as long as I can benefit the Archduke, he said. Lawrence handed Hans a report on the current situation. He asked him if he would like to take a look. Just look at it, will it just ignore the comments? Hans thought. And he's better than I thought. He thought. Hans was shocked by what was written in the report. Is Baron Helma and his two sons in prison? Hans said, surprised. Lawrence added that they would soon be publicly executed. Hans was surprised by Lawrence's decision. Ethan's advisor said that 357 people had died because of the Baron. So many people starved to death last winter because of him, Lawrence said. And how many others have suffered at the hands of his subordinates is beyond counting. He continued. Lawrence noted that the Baron's family tried to kill Ethan. Still think execution is too much? The advisor asked. Maybe I should start questioning your loyalty. Lawrence asked. Hans said that wasn't the case. He knew that if he had taken the Baron's side, he would have been executed by now. Wait, the eight gates have been destroyed. Hans asked. He was shocked that this had happened in just a day. Lawrence noted that this is only one of his completed tasks. He asked Hans what his plan was. I will gain the Count's trust by passing on false information. Young Master needs to get as close to him as possible as well, Ethan's subordinate continued. The advisor asked what would happen next. Hans was taken aback. And that's the whole plan. What is it? He asked. Hans said he'd only been there a day. And that was enough to trick the Count around his finger and go back, he continued. Hans understood why Ethan had chosen Lawrence as his advisor. He was saying that they couldn't predict the Baron's future actions. Isn't it better to just adapt to the situation? Hans continued. Lawrence let out a strained breath. Why did his sigh sound so condescending? Hans thought, annoyed. The advisor told Ethan's subordinate that this wasn't enough. Let me plan everything, Lawrence added. He was saying that Hans had missed something important. Ethan's subordinate asked him what exactly he was talking about. If you go back to the count like this, you'll lose your head, Lawrence said. Hans is confused. Thank you for coming all this way, Ethan would say. I'm Jaron from the Mrs. Trade Group, he said. Jaron added that he would be happy to work with them. Lawrence had said that there was no need for formalities in their communication. How's that? Yes, said Jaron, puzzled. He noted that Lawrence was an advisor to the Duke. Ethan asked Jaron is everything going according to plan. Jaron informed him that this was the case. I just wanted to give you the answer, he added. Jaron pulled the letter out of his side pocket. He suggested that perhaps the Duke was waiting for other news. I will personally thank Marquis Bloten for agreeing to run a difficult assignment, Ethan replied. The Duke took the letter out of its envelope. Ethan was taken aback. It's all nonsense, not a word to the point, and the handwriting is disgusting, he said enraged. Lawrence suggested that the king supported the Senate. Jaron didn't think that was good news. She said I should handle the problems between our families myself, Ethan replied. The advisor was happy with this news. Jaron didn't understand what was happening. Lauren explained that the king and the seven great families were the main obstacles right now. And he decided not to interfere, the advisor continued. Lawrence believed that this was exactly what Ethan wanted when he filed the petition. Yes, thanks to the letter, I became convinced that the great families are behind the Senate, the Duke said. He added what the king had thrown away for his own reward. Jaron and Lawrence were shocked, but we'll get back to that later, Ethan said. The Duke added that their plan was ready. The king has given us the stage, it's time to start, Ethan added. Jaron told Ethan about his plan, which involved getting potion supplies all over the country. However, my trading company will not be able to handle such volumes, so I decided that the House of Bausis will deal with the supplies, said Jaron. He added that his family has established trade relations throughout the country, so there should be no problems with this. 
It is also possible to agree on supplies to neighboring countries, and we will get at least a hundredfold benefit, he continued. Ethan said he saw no reason to decline his offer. The Duke asked me to tell the Marquis that he was looking forward to their cooperation. I will, Jaron said. There was a knock at the Duke's door. Come in, Ethan said. Lawrence told Ethan that the training was complete. He apologized to Jaron for not being able to finish the negotiations. Nothing, I understand everything, he replied. Jaron said he would send him a letter with all the details. Thank you, see you later, the Duke replied. Lawrence added that Menharton was waiting for them downstairs. The Duke went downstairs. The Archduke is truly an unfathomable person. Did he foresee the expansion of supplies? Jaron mused. He was amazed that Ethan was calculating everything in advance. Jaron hoped that Ethan would soon restore House Arden to its former strength. Lawrence, I'll leave the potion supply to you, the Duke replied. He asked him to handle everything as soon as they got the paperwork from Jaron. Lawrence accepted his order. Ethan asked if they were there. Menharton had said that this was where they kept the Baron. Was he questioned? The Duke asked. Yes, but even the torture did not help. There were still white spots on his story, Menharton replied. Ethan said he'd sort it out. The Duke praised him for his excellent work. Give me the key. You can return to your duties as Captain of the Knights, he continued. The Knight said he understood. Menharton was concerned about further action. Ethan told him not to worry. I will keep my promise, the Duke added. He was talking about sparing the rest of the Baron's family. Thank you, then I will return to my duties, the Knight replied. I'm so... Hargis thought to himself. When I was young and weak, when I was surrounded by enemies, I was so careful that from the outside I seemed unsociable. But when I became a member of the Senate, when I had power, I turned up my nose without noticing it, the Baron continued to think. He knew that this was his mistake. He was angry that he had underestimated the Archduke. Cross the line, I didn't know how strong he was. Cargas reasoned. The Baron heard someone open his door. Cargas was extremely surprised. He could see Ethan in front of him. The Baron's gaze was fixed on Lawrence. He was very scared when he saw it. He was telling Lawrence not to come over. The Baron asked them to stop. He said he told them everything he knew. The Duke said that he was not impressed with the Baron's acting. I can't believe that even in this situation, you're still hiding something, Ethan continued. Do you think that if you still have some useful information, you can buy some time? The Duke asked. The Baron said he didn't understand what he was talking about. Did you expect to wait for help? Ethan continued. He told him not to let the Baron hope for it. He tossed him a document. The Baron asked him what it was. Ethan told him to read it. Cargas was shocked when he saw the royal seal on the document. Ethan had told him that even the king had turned his back on him and his sons. Solve problems between families on your own, the Baron read to himself. Cargas was angry at this. The Baron fell into despair. He started to scream. I'll tell you everything I know. Please spare me and the boys, Cargas shouted. We'll see, the Duke replied. He ordered him to tell him everything first. Cargas said there was another floor under his house. I keep all the secrets there, including the Duke of Arden's relic. The Baron continued. Ethan was furious. You dare to steal a divine sword. Oh, said the enraged Duke. The Baron begged him to calm down. He said that it wasn't a divine sword. Of course, I am a member of the Senate, but I was not entrusted with it. Cargas shouted. And you know it's broken. The Baron added. Ethan fell into a stupor. The plot tells us about the divine sword Dranian. It was a perfect sword that could cut through anything, withstand any heat. It was a divine relic that had already been passed down from the old family head to the new one for many generations. This sword was a symbol of the Ardens. Ethan remembered that it was the sword he had used in his last battle. Even though I lost, the sword withstood all the blows of the Dragon King, and now it's broken. The Duke continued to think. Ethan had told him it couldn't be. Tell us how it happened, he added. The Baron began his story. Fifteen years ago, when the dragons attacked, countries that were not ready for defense immediately fell, the Baron said. The Ardens created a death squad that included the best members of the family, Cargas continued. The Baron talked about how this squadron was stronger and more talented than any knight, and they ended up challenging the Dragon King. But they all died, and all we found was the hilt of the Divine Sword, the Baron added. Ethan thought about how his father had also fought a dragon. The Duke asked what had happened to the Dragon King. Cargas answered him. That he didn't know this, he added that the Dragon King hadn't been seen since. The Duke assumed that the Dragon King was hiding. He thought that maybe they were able to seriously injure him. The main character asked why they agreed to peace. The dragons have lost their king. You have a chance to win, he continued. Cargas told him that all this had happened before Ethan went into a coma, and he asked if Ethan remembered it. The duke ordered the baron to respond. Startled, Cargas told him that they had made peace. Peace was initiated by the Xeno Empire. The baron continued. 
He added that it was Zeno who made the neighboring countries agree. The duke was extremely surprised by this. Ethan headed for the place Cargas had mentioned. There really is a secret passage, Lawrence said. Yes, Helma didn't lie, the main character replied. Ethan was thinking about the Baron's words. In his memoirs, he demanded that the Baron tell him more about this place. It's exactly as I said, after that battle, the Dragon King disappeared somewhere, but his commanders didn't go anywhere, and the army was still strong, so nothing changed, Karga said. The Baron added that after that, one of the ambassadors contacted the Xeno Empire, so the strongest of the countries concluded a peace treaty with the dragons. Also, Karga said that everyone else is after him. I don't understand, the Empire has never been weak, the Duke thought. Besides, they were better off in this world than in mine, and I'd need more details, Ethan thought. He reported that they had come. The Duke noticed that there was a protective spell at the entrance. Ethan thought the Baron had done a good job. He asked Lawrence to open the door. I'll leave it to you, he added. Lawrence set to work. This is where my father's relic is kept, but not the divine sword. I have a hunch what it is, the Duke thought. He was pretty sure. Lawrence was surprised that the room was larger than he thought it was from the outside. The counselor was amazed at how many things there were in this room. Can we even find the relic? What is it? He asked. Ethan told him that they had already found what they had come for. There was an object in front of them. The plot tells us about the memories of Cargas. It was while we were preparing the Duke's body for burial, the Baron thought. He thought about how he couldn't believe his eyes. The Baron's gaze was focused on a certain liquid near the Duke's body. Some kind of black metallic liquid leaked out of the Duke, Cargas continued to think. No one present knew what kind of liquid it was. The Senate debated for a long time what to do with it and finally decided that it would be safer to divide it up and keep it in parts, the Baron reflected. The Duke was talking about how the side families didn't have any information about the Eighth Ring. Ethan said that it was a relic that was passed down in his family by inheritance, like the Divine Sword. The Eighth Ring, Lawrence asked. The advisor added that this item did not look like a ring. The Duke said they named it that way because of its shape. Ethan activated the Black Flame breathing technique on the ring. The Duke activated all the mana flows throughout his body. The eighth ring began to emit a red color. It abruptly changed its shape. Suddenly, it transformed into energy. Mana began to swirl around the Baron. It flew in all directions. Ethan was overflowing with mana from within. He felt the power. Lawrence didn't understand what was happening to him. A bright flash of light appeared. The Duke was finally done. So, not bad he added. Lawrence asked me to explain what was going on with the Duke. Ethan revealed that he was consuming the ring. No one knows what it is made of but the Ardens have always had this treasure, he said. It was usually passed on to the new head of the family, and the ring can only be used in someone with strong Arden blood, the Duke continued. He specified that family members who didn't master the Black Flame breath wouldn't be able to use it. Lawrence asked if the Eighth Ring had any special power. Ethan said it was true. He told Lawrence that he would show her. Get out of the way, it could be dangerous, Ethan added. Lawrence listened to him. First you need to direct the flow of mana directly into the Eighth Ring. It will begin to greedily absorb it. The Eighth Ring will bind the owner hand and foot, the Duke thought. Shackles appeared on his body. I've already forgotten what it feels like. Great. Now I need to release all the mana accumulated by the ring. The Duke continued to think. A strong aura formed around him. The aura began to shine with a bright flame. Ethan felt a newfound power. Lawrence was taken aback. You just released all your mana. The advisor asked. Ethan said that this ring can accumulate mana and give it explosive power. It will be even easier to get the land back now, the Duke continued. He added that they need to take this into account in the plan. Lawrence listened to his orders. Ethan asked the counselor to find out about the other parts. Leave it to me, Lawrence replied. Not only do they not honor the father who sacrificed himself for them as a hero, but they also steal his relics out of greed. Wait until I get to you, the Duke thought angrily. Ethan thought about how he would deal with anyone who questioned his family's honor. We are transported back to the Duke's manor. Ethan was taken aback. He was amazed that the five pieces were taken out of his land. Lawrence told him that one part of it was held by the heads of four families, and one of them was in the Raimdall Kingdom. Ethan asked if this information was accurate. Yes, the Baron has confirmed everything, the advisor replied. I think it makes no sense for him to lie now. That's the problem. It won't be possible to put everything together quickly, the Duke said. Ethan added that it didn't matter right now. Right now, it's better to think about how to get Terran back, Ethan added. He said that they need to act with what they have. We will return to the issue of exported rings later, he added. Ethan added that it was thanks to Lawrence that he understood what they needed to do. The Duke offered to take the ring, which is hidden under their noses. Ethan ordered his advisor to prepare for an attack. We are transported to the small town of Port, where a new life has begun. 
Rumors were spreading throughout the city about the appearance of a hero's heir who was willing to fight for the people. Word of this quickly spread around the city. People began to believe that despotism had come to an end. They had a new hope on that very day. Local residents watched the execution site. The man shouted that they were coming out. The Marquis and his two sons. He continued. People were very happy about it. You're finished, you wretched worms, said the guy. This is revenge for my dead wife, he shouted. I lost my whole family because of you, the man said. The people wanted them dead. The knight ordered them to keep quiet. He announced the Archduke's arrival. The villagers were surprised by his arrival. This is the man who overthrew the Marquis as soon as he arrived in the city, said the surprised stranger. The residents believed that Ethan had saved their city and put an end to the Marquis's misdeeds. The Duke appeared before them. The Duke was addressing the people of Port. Not only did the Marquis of Cargas violate the contract, he also illegally appropriated the property of the residents, he said. Your family and friends suffered because of his actions, and there are also those who had to say goodbye to their lives, Ethan continued. I, the head of Arden, Ethan, will return to normal all tax rates, Helmut and his sons. According to the ancestral law, I deprived the status of Marquis and all titles, and also sentenced to death, Ethan announced. The locals were very happy about it. Glory to Arden. Happy people shouted. Glory to the Duke. They continued. We were shown the guillotine. Is all of this true? The Duchess asked. She was surprised that Ethan had captured the Marquis and Carga's family. Lawrence said it was all true. On the same day that he arrived in port, he captured the Marquis. And now he is restoring order in the city, his advisor continued. Wow, but if he sentenced a member of the Senate, won't the other seven clans interfere? The Duchess asked. Lawrence told her not to worry. His lordship takes all possible turns of events into account. Lawrence added. I see, you said that you came on the carriage that will continue on to port. The Duchess asked. She asked him to continue the conversation on the way there. Lawrence agreed with her. But this knight who is with you, said the advisor. He talked about how he forgot to introduce himself because of this situation. I am the Duchess's escort knight, he replied. Lawrence realized that this was the man the Duke had told him about. He said that it was sent by the Marquis of Bessus as a sign of alliance, the counselor Muse. The knight said that he would ride on horseback, and he asked Lawrence to get into the carriage with the Duchess. I'll follow behind with the other knights accompanying me, he added. They agreed with him. So that's it, the Duchess would say. As long as Ethan uses the accompanying factional structure, his strategy is safe, she continued. Did you mention that you are an assistant? The Duchess asked. She thanked Lawrence for answering all his questions. She added that she hadn't been able to find out the whole situation until now. I have too many questions, right? Oh, said the Duchess, looking embarrassed. She noted that Lawrence had a very good memory, and he was also very nice to her. The advisor said she was exaggerating. He asked her to address him as you because he was a subject of the Duke. Oh, can I do that? The Duchess asked. Lawrence said it was true. That's good, Ethan's sister added. She was glad that Lawrence was the Duke's trusted man. It feels like another little brother has arrived said a delighted duchess. She hoped they could become friends. Lawrence was very confused. How is it, such a noble fine person is acting so at ease with me? The duke is also. It seems like everyone in the Arden family is like this. The advisor reflected. They arrived at the designated location. The coachman stopped his horse. She was glad Ethan had met her. The duke greeted her. She was surprised by the size of the lock. Fulton greeted the duke. I have heard a lot about you from Mr. Geron, he added. I'm Fulton and I was sent by Marquis Bessus to accompany you, Fulton said. Ethan was pleased to meet him. Suddenly, the Duke felt a surge of mana. He's secretly using it to study me. Ethan mused. He thought that Fulton was good at hiding mana movements. An ordinary knight wouldn't have noticed, but not me. The Duke continued to think. Fulton was baffled. Ethan guessed that this knight was about rank 6. So Marquis Bessus must have gone to great lengths to send such a person, the Duke reasoned. He asked Lawrence to prepare a room for Fulton. Yes, I'm listening, the advisor replied. Fulton thanked him for that. It's strange, the amount of mana he has is only second rank, no matter what his abilities are. But how could a knight of this rank be able to dispel my mana? Fulton thought. The nurse asked Ethan if there was any news about Myers. The duke said that he had sent him a letter. Ethan led his sister to her room. Wow, this is my room. The duchess asked. He asked her if she liked the room. His sister asked him if it was really okay for her to use this room. Everything seems so expensive here, she continued. The Duchess of Arden should only use this one, Ethan said. His sister was very surprised by this. The Duke told her that she would be taking management lessons starting tomorrow, and the Duke asked her what she thought about it. Management, what is it? She asked. Yes, if you don't mind, I would like you to help me in this area, the Duke continued. 
He noted that if the sister does not want, she can refuse. How can I not want to? The Duchess asked. She said that Ethan does a lot for her, so she should help him. I don't know if I will succeed, but I will try my best to become your support. The Duchess added. The Duke thanked her. Ethan added that he would put another knight in charge of his sister instead of Fulton. His sister was taken aback. The Duke told her that she was resting, and they would see each other for dinner. His sister asked him to stop. What do you mean? The Duchess asked. Ethan left her. A knight of the sixth rank. He's not just someone who knows how to use a sword, he reasoned. Someone who has begun to understand the essence of the sword. A knight of the sixth rank, the Duke continued to think. Ethan knew that the knight could do more than he could. The reason why Count Lugon and Shimon are so calm is because they have several knights of this rank, the Duke mused. Ethan assumed that he wasn't strong enough to stand up to them all, because he'd only started training a month ago. Sir, it's me, the Duke would say. He asked him if he could come in. Fulton was surprised by Ethan's visit. The Duke asked if he could spare him some time. Yes, although I haven't put my things out yet, Fulton replied. If it doesn't bother you, then go ahead, he added. Ethan thanked him. The knight asked the Duke what he had come to see him about. Ethan said he had a suggestion. Saying this in front of the castle gates would be a bit impolite. I think it's quite normal now, the Duke continued. The Duke thought that Fulton understood what was going on. The knight asked what the gist of the offer was. You were also curious about my abilities, weren't you? Ethan was saying, I would like to learn one technique. There is still time before dinner. How do you like this suggestion? The Duke continued. Ethan asked him if the knight wanted to fight. The Duchess said that she had read a lot because it was already lunchtime. That's right, the sun is already setting, her subordinate added. She suggested that they have lunch together. It may be for a day, but today you are my... The Duchess said. The knight asked if this could be done. Of course, Ethan's sister replied. It is an honor, but an embarrassment to Sir Fulton, the knight replied. In front of Sir Fulton, the Duchess asked. The knight told her that the Duke had offered to give Fulton a duel. Ethan's sister was shocked. The knight noted that their duel was now in full swing. What can you do about it, his sister added. Ethan braced himself for the attack. He attacked Fulton. Ethan thought he had a pretty good shot. Well, then, can we increase the pace? The Duke thought to himself. Ethan braced himself for the next attack. His mana was burning with a bright flame. Fulton dodged the blow. The Duke attacked again. The attack speed is faster than I thought. I will delay. I can, on the contrary, get hurt myself. The Duke thought. Ethan pointed his sword at Fulton. He noticed that the knight had disappeared. Well, then, the Duke continued to think. The main character realized that he was being attacked from behind. Ethan managed to dodge his attack. Fulton continued to attack him. I can't figure out how he can restore mana from a broken aura and control it again, Fulton thought. He knew that an ordinary person couldn't do that. Also, how does the Duke manage to manifest abilities that exceed the available amount of mana? The knight continued to think. The plot tells us that the strength and speed of the knight depend on this directly. Therefore, based on the estimate of the amount of mana, it also distributes the level. But Fulton had never met anyone like Ethan so he didn't know that the fragments that were distributed throughout Ethan's body had the essence of flame, so each piece served as a clot of mana. He was able to transmit it all over his body faster and more accurately than he could squeeze it out of the center of his stomach. Fulton concentrated the mana in his body. Ethan slid back. It's a bit heavy, he said. Fulton asked what the Duke was talking about. It's amazing that with so much mana, you can do something like that, the knight said. Ethan was glad to have a match with a worthy opponent, because he hadn't thought about the time when he was just learning how to use a sword in a long time. The Duke said that now they would fight in earnest. Ethan activated the Eight Rings technique. A strong aura appeared around the Duke. Fulton was taken aback. He didn't understand why the Duke's mana pool had increased dramatically. There was a flash in Ethan's eyes. He started toward Fulton. The knight activated his mana flow. A fierce battle ensued between them. The people watching this fight were shocked. Duke Ethan, he already showed unprecedented abilities. When he fought us, just amazing, Menhart and mused. He was amazed that the Duke's skills had all increased in a couple of days. The knight was speculating about where the limit of his abilities lay. Fulton started toward Ethan's office. He continued to attack the Duke. The Duke's sword flew out of his hands. Ethan was taken aback. I lost, he said. The Duke told Fulton that he couldn't win. It was a good fight, Ethan added. The knight thanked him. Listen, Duke, he would say. Ethan turned his attention to him. During the battle, you have dramatically increased your strength and speed, so you didn't fight at full strength in the beginning. The knight asked. The duke told him that it was a special technique of his family. Wow, there's this technique, it's just amazing, Fulton added. If you had such a skill, I wouldn't even have the chance to use this technique, the duke continued. Ethan noted that he was happy with the battle, 
and then thanked Fulton for his time. What are you, on the contrary? It is I who am grateful to you, said the knight. Fulton was thinking that he had miscalculated. I just wanted to check if they were telling the truth about his ability. I didn't think it was so serious, the knight mused. The technique and movements that he showed are very good. Dot it also contains accurate knowledge, like from a textbook, but at the same time there are some elements that go against the generally accepted ones. Fulton was shocked by the level of swordsmanship. After reaching the sixth level, I wandered in a distracted state for another five years, the knight continued to think. The knight was frustrated that he couldn't reach the top level despite his best efforts. Fulton knew that in just half a year, he wouldn't be able to beat Ethan. He believed that Ethan's only drawback was the mana accumulation time. The knight called to the duke. You said you learned one trick from me today, but I also learned a lot from you, Fulton said. He asked the duke if there was any other way they could arrange a duel. Ethan was surprised by his suggestion. With such abilities, he might become famous, but on the contrary, he wants to learn something, the duke reasoned. Ethan said he was always ready for the next fight. Fulton said he meant it. After looking at his sword technique, I realized something, the knight mused. Ethan told Fulton that when he had free time, he would teach him a trick. Thank you for accepting my offer, despite how I behaved during the day, Fulton said. The duke asked him for two things, to accompany his sister and train with him. Ethan, the duchess shouted. The duke was taken aback. He was surprised when he saw his sister. You don't let a man who has come so far rest, said the furious nurse. The duchess told Ethan it wasn't polite. He tried to justify himself to her. I really don't know what's going on in his head, the knight thought. The duchess was swearing at her brother. They show us Ethan's estate. The man asked Fulton if it was true that his abilities were on par with his own. The knight said it was true. He was surprised at how strong Ethan was. Fulton said the duke has huge potential. Not only did his strength and speed exceed my expectations, but he also has a special mana control technique that exceeds his own level, the knight said. Fulton said it was the first time he had seen this type of ability. Well done, tell me even the smallest details about the duke from now on, Bloaton would say. Fulton said he would do as he was told. The knight added something that he would have typed in by the time of his next report. The duke was in a coma for a long time, but now he can also break through the mana sphere, the marquee reason. He thought that the duke's strength could be compared to the level of a knight of the sixth rank. So far, the duke has shown amazing resourcefulness. It seems that his combat skills are much higher than I thought, Bloaton continued to think. The Marquis was thinking that when Ethan took action, he wouldn't be able to stay away either. He turned to his subordinate. He wanted to assign a list of things that need to be quickly found and sent to Fulton along with the letter. The subordinate listened to his order. I am now convinced that the Duke can cause great changes in the Kingdom of Hydern, he reasoned. Bloaton believed that in this case, it was the best time to strengthen cooperation between the two families. The Knights raised the alarm. Members of the Group 8 Gates escaped from prison. Everyone, except those who put out the fire, catch the fugitives. The knight shouted. He ordered to catch every single member of the group. The guy said they were heading that way. Quickly follow them. The young man cried out. Hans was hiding behind a tree from the knights. He was talking about how they barely made it out of there. Where do we go now? He continued. At that moment, someone grabbed Hans. He told him to be quiet. The man said that the count had sent him to accompany Hans. He was telling him to head to a safe place. Hans agreed with him. They headed for safety. Hans knew that everything was going according to his plan. We are shown the memoirs of Hans. But you don't have to do that, do you? Ethan's subordinate asked. Lawrence said that it was necessary to do this in order to lull the Count's vigilance. It will be a little hard, but bear with it, the Duke's advisor added. I'm not some kind of prisoner. There's a limit to everything, he continued. Lawrence had told him that the Count was a ruthless man. He easily got rid of Baron Cargas, like a lizard that cuts off its tail. Even though the latter worked for him for a long time, Lawrence continued. He added that the Earl would not believe the head butler. Hans asked how long he needed to stay here. The Duke's advisor said it would be over soon. He told him that they were going to cause a commotion in the Eighth Gate that night. Lawrence added that at that exact moment, we will send a person to help Hans get out. As soon as you escape, you will meet one of the pursuers, Lawrence continued. Ethan's subordinate understood that everything was happening as Lawrence had said. The man pointed to the place where they needed to go. He said they had arrived at it. The man said that they are in an underground shelter, which is safe. Hans thanked him for his help. As soon as you were in the castle, you had to hide, so what happened? What is it? He asked. Hans said the duke had taken him. And then he put me in a dungeon and tortured me, he added. Mugina, seeing Hans's wounds, thought that he was on bad terms with the duke. You have deep wounds, you need to heal them as soon as possible, he added. Hans said that he was fine, he needed to contact the Count immediately. The man was taken aback. 
Hans explained that the crystal ball was taken from him during the attack. He asked the man for help. This is a very important matter that is urgent. Hans continued. The man agreed to help him. He said that he would contact the Count immediately. The plot takes us to the Duke's domain. He was interested in Hans's condition. Lawrence told him that everything was going according to her plan. That's good, now the Count will be a little more serious, Ethan said. The Duke was interested in the management issue. The Duke's advisor said they were recruiting new managers. He said that quite a lot of people were expelled from the duchy. Ethan left it to Lawrence. The counselor asked the Duke what he was reading. Ethan said he was reading a letter from the Marquis of Bloaton. The Duke assumed that Fulton had reported him to the Marquis. So that's it, is there something special? Lawrence asked. The Duke noted that he had something. Ethan said that in the letter, Bloaton wrote about sending a gift to the Duke to move the plan forward as soon as possible. The Duke believed that Bloaton wanted to make an alliance with him. A gift to make the plan move faster. Lawrence asked. Is that so? He added. The Duke said it was so. Ten to one, it's a miracle cure, Ethan would say. The Duke explained that the miracle cure was a rare plant with a high concentration of mana. He added that the plant absorbs this mana from the air. Ethan had talked about how miracle cures were made by treating such plants. The Duke added that if you eat it, you can quickly collect mana and fill the sphere. My skills and knowledge are enough to go beyond the usual, the Duke thought to himself. He understood that he only needed time and mana to reach a level like in his previous life. If my mana increases after the miracle medicine, then the fire part of it will become even hotter, Ethan continued to think. He believed that after this, the heat from his sword would not be comparable to before. An ordinary sword won't be able to withstand this heat and will simply melt, the Duke reasoned. Ethan wanted to go somewhere before the Marquess's presence arrived. The Duke added that he would assign Menhart and three other knights, and he also asked Lawrence to be careful. The counselor asked where exactly the Duke was going. Ethan said he needed to get something. Lawrence didn't understand what he was talking about. Take care of your business while I'm gone, the Duke would say. Ethan said that he needed to get a weapon that could withstand his mana. The Duke said that after creating a new sword, he would return to his domain. The plot takes us to Loindian, the capital of the Duchy of Arden. Lugon was very angry. The head of the faction took the death of a subordinate lightly. The Count shouted, so the Duke can kill all of his subordinates, and no one cares. Lugon continued. Shimon asked him to calm down. If the Duke did commit murder, what do you think our actions will be? Shimon asked. Naturally, the King and the Seven Clans will demand that we take responsibility for this. It is quite possible that our estates, no, our heads will fly off our shoulders, he continued. The Count hoped that this would be the case. And you will be responsible for all this, Lugun thought. The Count understood why the Duke had struck Cargas. He knew that you had been plotting something against him for a long time, the Count continued to think. And also realized that it was you who came up with the idea to destroy it. Lugun reasoned. I should add fuel to the fire and do this, so that you can tear each other apart. The Count mused. Pitiful worm, do you think I don't understand your plans at all? Shimon thought to himself. Hans informed the Count that everything had worked out. Shimon was glad of that. He asked Hans to tell him more about it. A subordinate of Ethan said that during the torture he was asked about Count Shimon. I immediately realized that this was my chance and tricked him by passing on false information about the faction. That's right, Hans said. Shimon praised him. He didn't think he trusted him for nothing. The Count was pleased with the result. The Duke's next target is Baron Romanton. Shimon mused. Have fun while you can, Lugon Emilton. The Count thought. The plot tells us about the dungeons. In nature, there are special areas where mana is collected in whirlpools. They attract wild monsters that gather in packs and form dungeons in such places. Mana affects monsters, and magic crystals appear inside dungeons. They are used for various magical actions, while the dungeons become something like a treasure cache. Ethan thought about how long it had been since he'd been here. There must be a dungeon in the vicinity, he reasoned. Of course, I really want to get crystals and treasures, but now it's more important to find a special metal, the Duke continued to think. The knight asked him to stop. He told him that the road to the village was closed. The knight asked Ethan why he was here. The Duke talked about how he wasn't an ordinary person. He asked me to open the gate and showed me his family heirloom. Even if you belong to one of the factions, not everyone can enter here, the knight continued. The man was surprised by the pattern that was depicted on Ethan's relic. The man saw a pattern of golden tongues of fire. The man realized that it was the symbol of the Duchy of Arden. Are you by any chance the Duke of Arden? What is it? He asked. The man told Ethan that he would open the gate immediately. He ordered the knight to bring the elder. Ethan started toward him. He was confused by the situation in this village. There is no traffic on such a wide street, and the resident's eyes are filled with anxiety. The Duke continued to think excitedly. 
Ethan assumed that the local people were wary of him. Or maybe their faces are full of fear, he reasoned. Ethan asked the knight about the village elder's current location. I'm sorry, a soldier has been sent for him. He'll be here soon, the knight replied. The duke said that he would go to him himself. He asked the knight to lead him to the elder. The village elder told the duke the story. The hunter of this village personally experienced this situation, he said. He was hunting as usual near the mine, when suddenly a strange sound was heard from there, the elder said. The hunter thought it was the sound of a pickaxe. He wanted to find out who was making these sounds. So I went closer to the mine, and there he saw something that he did not expect, he continued. The hunter saw skeletons in front of him. There were several dozen skeletons working with hoes. Jillian said, startled. Ethan asked the elder if he meant the dead. Yes, they were definitely skeletons, Jillian continued. The elder said that he was so scared that he didn't go in, but he clearly heard the sounds of a hoe. Ethan thought it was all very strange. All that can be obtained in an abandoned mine is the same metal, the duke continued to think. They show us Ephraim. It's not as powerful as mithril, but it's harder than steel. Its properties are quite similar to those of mana. Ephraim is often used to make magical tools. Ethan knew it would be a couple of years before the metal was discovered. He assumed that someone else was visiting the mine. He didn't understand what exactly people might be looking for in an abandoned mine. Judging by the elders' behavior, the villagers still don't know about the mineral's existence. So we need to find out if Ephraim is the exact target, the duke thought to himself. But the problem is, someone who has enough power to summon several dozen skeletons can also only be a dark magician, Ethan continued to think. The duke was afraid that if there really was a lick involved, then it was really serious. Ethan knew that the lick was a creature that was served by high-ranked undead. He knew that with his current strength, he wouldn't be able to defeat the lick's army. I may have to give up Ephraim, the duke thought. Ethan said he needed to check on something right now. He asked the elder about the location of the mine. He said it was this way, Ethan said. The main character went in search of her. Ethan finally found her. The duke said that he could hear the faint but distinct sound of instruments working. He was surprised that no one had put up a barrier there. Ethan assumed he was confident in his abilities. The elder said that he reported the undead to the baron. But I haven't seen those documents, the duke reasoned. If the elder isn't lying, and Helmut broke the contract and hid the truth, did he purposely allow a lick to appear in his territory? Ethan mused. He believed that something else was involved in this situation. The duke turned his attention to the working pickaxe. He had a view of the crowd of skeletons. I knew it was Ephraim. Ethan thought to himself. He couldn't believe that Ephraim was his target. His gaze was directed at the cloaked stranger. Judging from the aura I can feel, this is the dark mage controlling the skeletons, Ethan said. He was glad that it wasn't as dangerous as the lick. The duke thought he could easily take Ephraim. Who are you? What is it? The mage asked. Should someone who is about to die care? Ethan was saying. I don't know who you are, but you don't seem to be afraid of anything at all. Stop it. He shouted. The magician said that he would make a skeleton out of the duke. Ethan was shocked. He couldn't believe his eyes. The duke was very tense. Answer me, where did you learn the dragon breath technique? Yes, said the duke. At Ethan's words, the mage laughed. The duke asked what was so funny about it. You even know that. What is it? The mage asked. Then I can't even let you live. He added. Die. The mage shouted. Ethan dodged his magic attack. The duke was surprised that the mage had made the chain with mana. He was amazed at the amount of magic in his technique. How do you like my dark magic chain that crushed even a rank 5 knight? What is it? The mage asked. He assumed that the duke was sent by the villagers. How lucky you are. You'll have to give up your life for a mere pittance. The magician continued. He added that he would kill the duke and suck the mana out of him, then turn him into a skeleton subordinate. What a strange fellow, the duke mused. He assumed that his mana was at the fifth level, but this mage's technique was clumsy. Besides, he doesn't seem to know how to hide its course, the duke continued to think. In doing so, Ethan realized the weak point of his magic chain. Gotcha. The mage thought to himself. His chains disarmed Ethan. The duke was taken aback. He destroyed his weapon. I said that I even defeated a fifth, ranked knight, the mage continued. You're no fun to fight, he said. Ethan had told him that the wizard talked too much. The mage was shocked. Ethan cut his chains. No, wait, did you break my chains? The mage shouted. He knew Ethan hadn't just cut his chain with his sword. He cut off the flow of mana that went along this chain. The magician continued to think. Ethan attacked him. He didn't understand how the duke managed it. This isn't the time to gape in surprise. The mage mused. He recited his technique. Pitch black. He shouted. The magician added. Ethan was heading in his direction. Well, I can handle those easily, the duke said. Ethan attacked him with his sword. Ethan cut through the mage's defenses. He didn't understand what was going on. 
The mage ordered his subordinates to help him. The skeletons charged Ethan. And you won't be able to attack me and fight off the skeletons at the same time. The gloating mage shouted. Die. He added. Ethan concentrated his mana and prepared to attack. Bright flames appeared around the duke. The skeletons flew in different directions. The mage was startled. Ethan attacked him with his technique. It went straight to his heart. The duke slammed him right into the wall. He was thinking that he had finally confirmed that the mage's mana pool was right next to his heart. The mage screamed in pain. Ethan understood that the way of governance was the same as that of the dragon race. I learned this information in my previous life when I was researching dragons to fight them. The duke reasoned. Instead of using the mana pool in the lower abdomen, they control it with their heart, he mused. We called it the dragon's heart, Ethan thought. He was surprised that the mage had added a breathing technique to it. I ask you again where did you learn this technique? Ethan was saying. Judging by the mix of human and dragon techniques, you couldn't have invented this method alone, the main character added. He assumed that there were dragon races that taught the mage this. Your reaction speaks for itself, Ethan continued. He ordered him to tell him everything he knew about the breathing technique. The duke pointed out that if the mage remained silent, his pain would only get worse. I don't know where you came from, but you're pretty strong. Yes, the mage replied. However, the order will exist forever. Stop it, he shouted. There was a strong explosion in the mine. The ground began to shake. Ethan's mana was concentrated in his hand. The duke said it was dangerous. If I didn't leave the mana of the eight rings, there wouldn't be a living place left of me, Ethan added. He assumed that he had figured out the order of the breathing technique. He was talking about the order. There was also a pseudo-religion in his previous life, the Duke Reason. These were groups of mentally ill people, fascinated by the power of the dragon race, who ended up worshipping and serving it. A dark wizard who followed the teachings of the order, the Baron's Lost Records, a breathing technique that combines human and dragon techniques, Ethan continued to think. He thought it was all very complicated. I don't think there's more than one of them in this vast duchy, he mused. The duke suggested that it might have been infiltrated by members of the dragon race. Ethan was furious. How dare they hide in the territory of Arden? He reasoned. The main character said that after creating the sword, he will have a lot to do. The story tells us about the dwarves. They live in the mountains, deep underground, and are skilled with metal, precious stones, and various tools. The skill of even the most outstanding among people in comparison with their skills is just child's talk. Humans have always been amazed by these abilities, because the dwarves have tried to use them for their own purposes, to capture them and make them their subordinates. After this, they began to hide from people and live in remote places that no one knew about. Before the war with the dragons and the formation of the alliance, dwarves were never seen again. Their technique was very useful during the war, and I myself used it several times, the duke reasoned. He thought about how he had made friends with them and found out where their settlement was. It was exactly here, so what happened? Ethan mused. The main character thought that he did not see a single warrior, as if this place had long been abandoned. My biggest problem was whether I could convince them to make a sword for me, but I can't find any dwarves right now, and I don't have anyone else to turn to, since they're the only ones who can work with Etherian, Ethan thought. The dwarf turned his attention to the duke. He asked him why Ethan had come here. The duke told him that he wanted to place an order. He asked him where the other dwarves had gone. The dwarf didn't know what he was talking about. He asked him why he had come here. I'm sure there are quite a few masters in your city, too, the dwarf added. Ethan didn't know what he was talking about. The dwarves have long since left here to work, he said. The dwarf asked him if he really didn't know about it. There are still such people. The duke asked where all the dwarves had gone. Try looking in the north, he said. The dwarf said the city of Creston should be full of them. The dwarves who hate humans have gone to a human city. The duke thought, surprised. Ethan thanked him and gave him a bottle of alcohol as a gift. The dwarf was glad of that. You're a smart guy. He added. May the hammer's blessing be with you. The dwarf added. Muradni was shocked. Broke it again. What is it? He asked. If you're a duke, then you can do anything. Muradni asked. He asked Ethan if he really knew how to use a sword. Muradni said it was the first time he had ever seen a man who used a sword so often. He was taken aback when it came to money. Don't do anything, kid. That's right, Muradni said. He asked who Ethan thought he was. You'd better buy me some wine and wait a month, he added. Muradni gave his word as a blacksmith that he would make a better weapon. As far as I know, dwarves have no prejudices about the status of humans, and they are more interested in making weapons than money. But now he says that the dwarves have gone to work, the duke mused. Someone was trying to call out to Ethan. He finally responded. The knight asked if he was alright. The duke said he was fine. I'm sorry to make you worry, Ethan added. 
The knight said that it was a great honor for him that the duke came to see him personally. Ethan was amused by his reaction. The main character noted that this street is quite noisy. He asked if it was always like this. The knight told Ethan about the dwarf sales prowess. If you go to a clever merchant, you will be left penniless, he added. The knight said Ethan didn't have to worry. He told the duke that he would show him a safe place. The knight thought Ethan would be satisfied. The duke thanked him. The knight led him to a good place. He told Ethan that this blacksmith shop was famous for its quality. It's called steel and fire, the knight added. The duke was surprised by the size of the queue at the blacksmith shop. I wonder if we can get there today, he continued. The knight told him to wait a bit. I'll try to go inside and talk, he said. The dwarf was asking people to get in line. Look, mister, it looks like you've come to do a pretty good job, since you have the precious Ephraim with you, but this forge won't be able to use the metal properly to preserve its property, the dwarf told him. Ethan was surprised that the dwarf immediately understood the contents of his bag. He noted that his eyesight was sharp. The duke asked him how much he knew about Ephraim. You're asking me how much I know. No, the dwarf replied, laughing. He continued to laugh loudly all over the street. Ephraim is able to enhance the properties of mana by converting them, so it must be floated at a very high temperature, which makes it difficult to work with this metal, the dwarf said. However, the more you heat it up, the higher its quality and ability to use it for magic items will become, he continued. And the widow's hot pressing method can improve its accuracy before the metal crystallizes, the dwarf replied. He added, the master pointed out that this is the wrong question. I should have asked if there was a dwarf who knew Ephraim better than I did. No, the dwarf said. He said that there is no such master. I'm sure there's no dwarf in the world who knows more about Ephraim than I do, the master continued. The knight told Ethan that he could go inside, and he informed the dwarves that he was an important customer. The knight asked what the master was doing here. The duke assumed that the knight knew him. He said the dwarf's name was Pofferance. Master, the dwarf was saying, surprised. Are you the Duke of Arden who was in a coma? Pofference continued, who captured Cargas as soon as he woke up. He added surprised. Ethan was surprised that as soon as Pofference found out his status, he became polite. He noted that dwarves weren't like this before. I prefer the impudent attitude that was before, the Duke added. The angry knight told Lawrence to leave them alone. How dare you treat Master like this? He continued. Ethan said he wanted to entrust his order to a lollipop. The knight was confused. The main character told him not to worry. And if you don't mind, please send this letter to Port Castle as soon as possible, Ethan added. The knight said he would follow his orders. He asked the duke to be careful with this dwarf because he had a criminal record. Ethan stiffened. The dwarf told him the story of what he had been tried for. About ten years ago, I had a competitor named William, he said. We were both quite famous craftsmen in the capital of the same kingdom, the dwarf continued. Once there was a decree that blacksmiths were being recruited to the royal palace, Pofferent said. He was confident in his abilities. William and I both knew that my skill level was higher, he continued. I spent several sleepless nights trying to craft a true masterpiece, but in the end, it was a real defeat, the dwarf continued. He told Ethan that William had bribed the judges. But it wasn't enough for William, and he accused me of cheating, and that's how it turned out, Pofference said. He said that he wanted to make one app for the duke. As you can see for yourself, my forge is living out its day, but I would like to craft weapons for you completely free of charge. The dwarf screamed. He asked Ethan to promise that if he liked the weapon, his clan would sign a contract with him. I want to bet everything I have left in my future on you, Pofferent said. Ethan thought about it. He asked the dwarf what they would do if he didn't like the product. Then you can cut my throat, Pofferent said, and the duke said that in that case, he had no reason to refuse him. He asked me to show him his abilities. That's good, the deal turned out. No, said the happy dwarf. He asked Ethan to wait three days which is exactly how long he needs to create the best sword from Ephraim. The duke was surprised that it would take so little time. No matter how outstanding you are, dwarves work alone, he said. Ethan asked if Pofference could handle it alone. The dwarf had told him that they had changed a lot. Do you know what I learned from William? What is it? He asked. The other dwarves appeared behind him. It's having pride in your blacksmith skills, not just standing on your own and making reliable allies, the dwarf continued. He asked Ethan to prepare a contract. The Flame Hammer Forge will craft the best sword for you, said a confident Pofference. 